All right, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Judge Glenn Reese, retired. I am the acting chair today. I'm gonna to call the meeting to order. Uh, we're gonna begin with the committee members and a roll call vote. Of course. Um, Bakshian? Present. Boyd? Uh, present. Chan? Present. Dugan? Dugan? I see your, I don't know if we need an audible, but I see him and I see his, his lips moving. We can't hear you. Present. Thanks. My apologies. No problem. Evans? Here, thank you. Gardena? Here. Harrison? Present. Dr. Henderson? Present. Lynn? Lynn? No, Lynn? Is that my Lynn Spencer? Is that my Lynn, Adrian? Oh, no, Esther I'm, Lynn. I'm not usually this early oh. in the alphabet. Oh, yeah. No, it's Esther Lynn. Esther Lynn. Yeah. Sorry. Thanks, Adrian. Mm -hmm. uh, Montez? Montez? And I'll call Pertula. Pertula. Judge Reeser. Here. Rodriguez. Present. Judge Rosie. I am here. Givaletto. Here. Thank you. Silverman. Here. Spencer. Here. Thank you. And Williams. Present. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. So we have a quorum. It is now time for public comment. I'm going to request that the public commenters limit their uh, points to two minutes. Uh, so uh, do we have any public comment? We do. And uh, Josh Pertula, you can unmute. I should be unmuted. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, folks, I just wanted to, uh, under public comment, say it's Josh Petrula, Chair of Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future Bar Exam. Uh, and I'm sorry I won't be able to participate today. Judge Reeser, thank you so much for jumping in um, and assisting. Um, but please know I will be listening as a member of the public today. Uh, and hopefully, after the presentations and robust conversation, that this commission will, will be better prepared to agree on some recommendations uh, at the next scheduled meeting in June. That, that, that's really the goal today. Um, and uh, I just wanted to make sure that uh, uh, I, I noted that at the beginning of the meeting. So thank you. And I look forward to seeing everybody in June. Thank you, Josh. A a any further public comment? We have one public comment. Good morning. This is Claire Solot from the Legal Service Funders Network. It's a pleasure to be with all of you once again. I just wanted to give a quick update, both with regards to the LSFN LAC survey that was recently done, which um, reports back that there is robust hiring that will happen in the public interest sector over the next three years of new attorneys and that there is also robust interest in both the pathway to licensure as well as the LSFN fellowship. We're currently finishing up placing our 2022 cohort. It is uh, larger and more diverse than ever. And we have shared with State Bar staff reports on both these issues, which I hope they will share with you as well. As always, happy to answer questions and thanks for the time. Thank you, Ms. lot, and thank you for your work. All right, any, any further public comment? Okay. Not at this time. All right, so um, Audrey. Great, let me, I'm um, going to promote. Um, so on the agenda, we're going to uh, bring back the minutes to approve at the June 9th meeting. And I'm going to promote Joanna Premi Abbott from Oregon's task force to join us. Let me see when she has joined.
Joanna, can you unmute and there you are. Hi. So you'll remember Joanna has come um, to the Blue Ribbon Commission before from the Oregon Task Force and she's here today to give us an update on the status of the Oregon Experiential Pathway. Hi, welcome. Um, are you ready for me or do you have to approve minutes still? We're gonna move past that in okay. the minutes at the next meeting, so thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, so my name is Joe Perini Abbott. I am, I've been on the Oregon Board of Bar Examiners for about six years. I've been grading bar exams a little longer than that. Um, I was the vice chair in 2020 when the world sort of imploded and uh, got pulled deeply into the issues around COVID and how we were dealing with it. Um, what came out of that was a charge from the Oregon Supreme Court for us to consider alternatives to the bar exam as pathways to licensure in Oregon. Um, that came in September of 2020 and I took on the task of chairing the task force that um, between September of 2020 and June of 2021, we studied three different models, the diploma privilege model, the supervised practice model, sort of modeled after articling in Canada, and the um, curriculum-based model, which has turned into the Oregon Experiential Pathway that I'm gonna focus my comments on today. Um, that was modeled after the Daniel Webster's program in New Hampshire. And I believe you guys have also heard from people uh, with their, from that program. Uh, in June of 2021, we recommended to the Supreme Court that we adopt a supervised practice pathway as well as the Oregon experiential pathway um, as, and keep the UBE. So we saw it as sort of a three-legged stool of choice for applicants uh, that each of these models we believed could adequately um, assess competence of, of attorneys to determine whether they are fit to practice. Uh, and we believe that the choice option is really where we gained a lot of equity ground because we were giving people the option for how they would present their competency. Um, the court asked us to go back and do some further research. We did, we presented again in January of this year at which point our court approved in concept both new pathways and asked us to form a development committee um, overseen again by the Oregon Board of Bar Examiners to actually now take these ideas, take it from a policy level discussion of should we be aiming to do this to an actual here's how we're going to do it phase. And that um, development committee, uh, we are calling it the Licensing Pathways Development Committee. Uh, and it is made up of 13 voting members with a heavy emphasis on practicing lawyers, but also recognizing the need for close partnerships with the law schools. Each of our three law schools within the state has a voting seat on the, um, the committee, as well as bar staff. Um, the executive director of the Oregon State Bar also has a voting seat as we dive into this work. And so where we are at now is working um, not just among ourselves, but also with IELTS, who I think you guys have also heard from probably extensively, and the NCBE. So there is now a partnership between IELTS, the NCBE, and Oregon to figure out how we move this into an actual practical, implementable um, programs, including assistance from the NCBE with psychometricians to help us come up with rubrics and um, figuring out if this is what we're calling competency, what are the assessments we need to be making, what goes into the portfolio, and how do we assess those to ensure that we are actually meeting those goals. Um, it's a pretty exciting partnership because IELTS and the NCBE have not partnered in the past. And um, it's really, I think, a syner like a synergy between them is, a, is really powerful in the legal market. So we're in um, the phase in which we are now about to dive deeply into listening sessions around the state of Oregon with um, all of our county bars, which seems daunting for us. I can only imagine what a project like that would look like for California. Um, but with all of our law schools, our county bars, the specialty bars, the affinity bars, and specific groups of legal consumers to ensure that one, we have community buy-in on these programs, but two, that we're hearing the voices of the community, um, the people who will be hiring these newly licensed lawyers and the people that these newly licensed lawyers will be serving 
to ensure that we, um, as we go to make our rubrics, right, and, and say, okay, let's ensure our rubrics are assessing competency, we are hearing from these employers and consumers as to what they want to see in newly licensed lawyers. So that's where we are right now. Um, we think that will be about a six month process. And then um, with six months to take that from there to drafting. And so we're hoping to be taking this back to the Supreme Court again next late winter um, for, a, for a final vote. And then um, possibly if it happens as quickly as we hope to be implementing in fall 2023, if, if possible, um, at least with pilot programs in the law schools um, and the supervised practice pathway. Um, we'll see how quickly things can move. That, that's our ambitious timeline. So um, my understanding from talking with Audrey is I'm gonna focus my comments a bit on the Oregon experiential pathway, although I'll talk a little bit about the supervised practice pathway. Um, so we took this pretty much wholesale from the Daniel Webster's program in the University of New Hampshire. We looked at that deeply um, and uh, while it's not one for one, it's pretty close. The, our goal is to implement something pretty close to that here in Oregon. So we only have three law schools. Again, I recognize a huge difference between us and California. We have, um, we already have a very close relationship between the Oregon Board of Bar Examiners and our three law schools. We meet with administrators from those law schools every other week. We're in constant communication with them. Um, again, much easier to do when you only have three law schools in your state. So the law schools were all represented on the task force and we're in continuing conversations with them, of course, as we go forward on this for what this looks like. Um, but the idea is that there's a fairly set curriculum for your second two years of law school. And that set curriculum focuses students mostly on experiential learning of some type, whether that's clinical or externships. And I'm gonna talk about that because um, that has been a point of contention in our, in our discussions um, or simulation-based courses. So if you think back to your law school experience, maybe you took trial ad or negotiations where you're actually doing legal work with simulated cases. Um, and what we found really great out of the Daniel Webster's program is they found ways to make take simulation courses to a whole new level. I think with their they have an actual client counseling course. They have a pre-trial advocacy course where you're writing so motions for summary judgment. Right, it's beyond at least when I went to law school 13 years ago. It's way beyond what was available then in saying let's actually reshift for students who want it the idea of legal education to we're not just going to read cases and you know think about evidence right think about the old chief case we're going to make you write motions in limine and argue do mock arguments on the rules of evidence so you're actually up there using them and producing work product that can be assessed then by the board of bar examiners so the board of bar examiners is looking at maybe a motion in limine that you wrote in your evidence class uh, rather than just an MPT answer that you had an hour and a half to do under, you know, weird circumstances in a bar exam, we're saying here, you know, write a motion limine and we're going to look at that to determine if it's competent legal work. Um, so we, the, in our ultimate report to the, ta to the Supreme Court in June, we laid out what we see a potential curriculum being. That curriculum is not locked in. We, uh, we have specifically agreed with the law schools that we will work with the law schools to ensure that, um, that what we're asking them to do is workable, right? We can't, we don't want to just be forcing this down their throats. That's not a good way to have a partnership coming out of, out of this. Um, but if, you, if you've seen our report and I'm uh, assuming it's been shared at various times on pages 12 and 13, we do lay out sort of what we think it should look like. And it has um, specific courses um, that students can choose from, sort of like buckets, choose one from here, choose two from here. And then it has a um, minimum actual experiential requirement of 15 credits. And this is where we did have deep discussions around, can that be externships or clinic? Does it have to be clinics? I do think that there is a real benefit to clinical work where the law schools are controlling the quality of the advisor. 
but we understand that if we want to make this available more broadly, um, that may not be feasible. Clinics are expensive for law schools to run. And so that is a big discussion point that has not yet been resolved around those experiential credits being clinic-based or, or how many of them have to be clinic-based versus I'm working for the public defender's office or the state's attorney's office, which is great experience, but sometimes less um, certain in, in the supervision the students are getting and in the mentorship the students are getting. Uh, and then there would be a capstone requirement. Um, the Daniel Webster's program's capstone is that client counseling course that they do. And the ultimate capstone is actually a um, client counseling session, which is in many ways like a massive, the most real world, world issue spotting exam you can find, right? Because not only are they testing the client counseling skills, but this client's coming in with problems and the, the student is expected to spot, okay, you have a contract problem, you have a, you know, torts problem. So it's, it weaves in that substantive work with client counseling skills, which is what being a real lawyer really is. Um, we have not put the parameters around what our capstone will look like and where uh, that is a big part of what we're hoping to work with the NCBE and IELTS on to ensure that what we whatever we do put into place is a valid assessment. Um, with the OEP, we've, we are not going to require any period of supervised practice following it. That is something that the original task force established. The plan is it, just like the Daniel Webster scholars, if they graduate and the board of our examiners passes their portfolio, so the work product that they've been gathering for two years, if the board of our examiners looks at this and says, yes, this is competent legal work, then that person will be licensed to practice upon graduation. And um, our thinking behind that was that, um, sort of like the bar exam, if you clear the hurdle of the bar exam and we determine you're competent from taking the bar exam, we don't require supervised practice. If we've looked at your work product for two years, we don't, we're not gonna require supervised practice. Now, could there be a bigger conversation about whether the legal system in general would benefit from everyone having a period of supervised practice like a Delaware model? Probably, but unless we're gonna start imposing it on those who took the bar, we didn't see that it was, um, commensurate, but to impose it on people who are coming to you. We are saying that we in these courses and we've seen your work, right? This is not a Wisconsin diploma privilege model where you graduate and we trust the law schools to if you pass, you're a lawyer. The Board of Bar Examiners has seen your work and we think it's competent legal work. And so that's um, why we've not required supervised practice in that model. Um, then we do still have, but we do, we are proposing that there's a separate supervised practice model. So for those students who either don't go to law school within Oregon or don't wanna take this two-year curriculum, but also don't wanna take the bar exam, the bar exam is always there as an option. Um, if they have someone within Oregon who qualifies for our standards for what a supervisor would be, and that is again something we're looking at in this development stage. But we had talked about, you know, is it five years of practice? Is it ten years of practice? There would be some training component from the Oregon State Bar before they jump into being a supervisor. Um, but if a individual has a supervisor lined up that is approved by the Oregon State Bar, they can practice law under that supervisor. For um, we're aiming at about a year and we're, we're talking about what that actually looks like in hours because we don't want to just count sort of button chair hours at a law firm. It's legal work hours. And so is that, you know, if we're all going off a 2000 hour model, is that, you know, what period of that are you doing substantive legal work? Is that 1500? Is it 1700? Is it 1200? So we're, we're working on that hours. That will be available for individuals who don't take this pathway. Um, or don't pass this pathway, say they fail the, their portfolio or fail the bar, the supervised model practice will be there for individuals who fail otherwise. From that pathway, we still will be collecting work product. The board of our examiners still will be assessing a portfolio similar to what they were expected to do in the OEP model. Um, and that the NCBE and IELTS are helping us to ensure that those two, the work product we measure whether you come from OEP or the supervised practice pathway, 
will look similar in how we assess it because that we're assessing minimum competence practice law, right? We don't want different levels of assessment between the two programs. Um, the matching, we at this point don't see the Oregon State Bar taking a huge role in matching with supervisors. That's we we are planning on putting that either on law school career services or individuals, right? If someone's been a paralegal at a firm and take in going to law school at night and those partners want to be their supervisor and they qualify otherwise, that's that's great. Um, I think as as the program develops, maybe we could see a role for the state bar to play more role in matching, but at this point, we're taking on a lot with two alternative pathways as it is, and we have to recognize at some point there is a resource limitation to what we can do. Um, so I think those are all of the points that Audrey and I discussed that you guys may be interested in hearing about, but I'm happy to answer questions. Um, there's still a lot of work for Oregon to do, but we're, we're moving forward. Um, okay. Uh, Mylin. Hi, thank you so much. That's great. Um, under the OEP, the assessment of the portfolio, is that happening all at the end or is it happening throughout the second and third years of law school? I think like the Daniel Webster's program, the goal will be to have it happening real time so that if someone in their second year is realizing I'm just not cutting it, um, they can choose to go back to a traditional law school curriculum and take the bar, right? We don't want someone trapped in this in this curriculum if they're not cutting it in the okay. curriculum. And, and then I guess relatedly, would they also have the option of redoing that portion of the portfolio um, if you haven't I, gotten that far. Yeah, I, we haven't gotten that far. When we've talked about it in theory, there's sort of like a, we think they could redo up to a point, but at some point there is going to have to be a cut bait line. And we haven't drawn that line yet. Judge Reeser. So, um, Joanna, thank you. I, I, know, I know it's a work in progress, but with respect to the supervised practice model, has there been a delineation with respect to out-of-state individuals who might come from a non-ABA accredited school or it has, the, has there been no definitive assessment on that? So right now our standard is for the supervised practice model, they would have to meet our other, they would have to be meet the qualifications to sit for the Oregon bar. Okay. Um, which in Oregon right now does require an ABA accredited law school or a period of practice in another state. I forget if it's three or five years. That's a rule we may revisit at some point, but we're not tying it into this. Thank you. No. Thanks, Joanna, for your presentation. Um, I had a couple of questions. Uh, I'm wondering, um, wh what do you, what is Oregon anticipating the capacity wise for folks going into the either the uh, supervised practice program or the OEP program? And then um, uh, to follow up on that question, a uh, uh, second part here for the, uh, the experiential program. Um, I'm wondering, do, 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 does the group have a sense of how long it would take for a student to come up with a portfolio and then how long it would take for the bar of examiners to um, you know, evaluate that portfolio? Is there, is there like a time estimate? Yeah, so both are great questions. I will tell you, Audrey and I talked before this mm -hmm. uh, on capacity issues. Oregon, we grade about 700 bar exams a year. So just in scope, I realize that is like an order of magnitude different mm -hmm. from California. Um, we would expect still quite a few people plan to take the bar. And um, so in terms of supervised practice, we think the market will limit that, you know, the number of supervisors is going to be what limits the supervised practice pathway. We don't see the bar putting a limit on that. The law schools are really the ones who will make the decision around the OEP side um, and capacity. And our goal is for it to be available to anyone who wants it. Again, I don't think everyone's going to want it. Um, I think some people really like the idea of taking a doctrinal path through law school versus a practice-based path. Um, but we are going to allow the law schools to start small, right? The first year or two, 
it's going to be a smaller program that ramps up. And I think that will probably benefit the bar as we get used to this grading process as well. Uh, we have not, the portfolio for the OEP will be built over the two years, but like um, I said earlier, I, I think we'll be grading sort of as it goes along. So if you've passed 2L semester one, 2L semester two, 2L semester three, by the time we're grading 2L semester four, the hope would be it wouldn't be an overwhelming amount of grading material. And it is something like the bar exam that we grade in, a, you know, we sort of hunker down and grade however many in a week period so that students are practice licensed to practice as quickly as possible at or after graduation. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dean Gardina. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Joanne. It was, it was a really great presentation. I'm looking forward to see how it develops. A um, couple questions. One is um, when you're when you're talking about the advisory board, you talked about adding uh, having practicing attorneys plus some law school representatives. Did you think about adding um, clients or consumers to that particular advisory board as well? So we have thought really hard because we do think that's an important group. Um, we've just really struggled with how to identify that person or those people, especially on such a small board. We are going to have an advisory group to the board that we're trying to get that voice for. And actually just yesterday at a meeting, we started discussing for the listening sessions, at least we certainly need to access those groups. Um, you know, and we were talking, okay, can we go to our probation officers and say, hey, can you collect some of your people, you know, former criminal defendants, like we want to hear from everyone, right? And so um, it's easy to say, okay, let's go to in-house counsel, right, who are our clients, but it's it's going to be harder to tap these other groups. And that's one thing IELTS and the NCB are helping us work on. And But we are trying specifically on the listening session side to um, find ways to tap into all of those types of legal consumers. Um, and even those potentially who didn't access uh, yeah. legal services to find out what those barriers were. Because I think one of the exciting things about what Oregon is doing is it hopefully allows you to design something that is going to be client-centered and human-centered so yeah. that people go into the profession with that mindset. Um, so I was really glad to hear about the, the listening sessions. Um, another thing, I served on CAPA, and one of the things that jumped out at me uh, a lot was the, that idea of criticality, that new graduates didn't understand the potential harm to a client until about the third year of practice. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, did you guys incorporate any, I, for lack of a better word, disciplinary experts or ethical experts to kind of identify what are those major areas where attorneys tend to get uh, into disciplinary issues or other types of problems in practice? We did. So Oregon has, um, our malpractice group is actually run by the bar. It's the, pub, uh, the professional liability fund, the PLF. And we, on the original task force, we had the PLF with a seat at the table and they will be on the um, advisory group as well. Um, and I just have two more questions. I, I Sorry to dominate. Um, you, you mentioned in passing the idea of a paralegal that might be working full-time and going to school at night. Um, but it sounds like your curriculum and your thinking about the experiential program was, was focused on a full-time program, three years long and very traditional. Is, is that accurate? Yes. So the supervised practice pathway, I think, is more geared at the paralegal going to school at night. Got Although it. Lewis and Clark, um, I don't know about Willamette and U of O, but I know Lewis and Clark does have a night program that, okay. you know, we certainly are, would be happy to work with them on finding a way that makes the OEP accessible to all of their students and not just those in a full-time day program. Great, and, and so one more, and I might be uh, actually, uh, I shouldn't be asking this question, it should go to Dr. Henderson, but I, this is one of the things that of course we struggle with in terms of moving off the exam, which is how do we make sure this is a valid and reliable test? Is that part of the rubric piece or how are you guys struggling with that question? Yeah. That is 100% why we think we couldn't do this without the NCBE and IELTS's partnership. Um, we are, the NCBE um, 
Judy Gunderson has come out and said, look, our job is not to put on a bar exam. Our job is to license lawyers. And if states want to find alternative ways, that's where we're going to go. Um, and so they are, we, we plan to rely heavily on the NCBE and IELTS to help us ensure that what we come up with is valid and reliable. Okay. Thank you. That's a good segue to you, Dr. Henderson. <laughs> Thank you. You're able to hear me okay? Yes. yes. Um, so I've got a couple of questions um, as well. And the first concerns the simulated cases that you described. I really like the idea of simulated cases. Um, and I'm wondering if uh, they are to be standardized across the schools and um, how the uh, standard setting process for passing a simulation might um, be uh, defined uh, so that it's equivalent to, uh, you know, pass, equivalent in difficulty to pass the different simulations. Yeah, so we have not gotten to the point at which we've, the, the schools have agreed to make it uniform, but they haven't said they won't. Um, there are some national programs like the um, National Institute for Trial Advocacy, NIDA, that puts out law school curriculum like this. So where I went to law school, Northwestern, I know the same trial ad problems that I did 14 years ago are being used today. And, and maybe we'll use those or, or different ones similar to that. Um, and then the idea of passing it will ultimately go to the board of bar examiners, right? The, they're, they're, they'll have to pass the class with their professor, but in terms of passing for competence in the program, that will be the board of bar examiners using the same rubric to judge whether you're a Willamette student or a U of O student or a Lewis and Clark student um, for passing for our purposes. So one of the things about simulated cases um, is going to be, I think, that they're highly memorable. And people in school, close proximity to each other, can't be expected to uh, keep secret what their experience is in a simulated case, really. So um, you are going to need a boatload of these, I think, yeah. and, and, uh, and ways of refreshing them uh, over time. Um, has that been thought about at all? Do you have any idea of the resource requirements for it? Um, we have not gotten to that point yet, but that's a really good point. Cause I think, like I just said, the same simulated case has been used at Northwestern Trial Ad for well over 14 years. And we all started our closing with, oh no, Joe, cause this woman is shot, <laughs> shot by her husband. <laughs> that's a fair point. Yes, that gets passed down from student to student and probably not the best way to assess <laughs> competency if you just take it from the classmate above you. Exactly my concern about it. Um, so um, if, if I could shift my questions to the kind of training that would be, be available to, in fact, be required of people who are going to evaluate the simulations, um, uh, the rubric, right? And, and so then how to interpret the different elements of the rubric and uh, apply them as uh, individuals make their way through these cases. Has that been thought about at all? Um, that is what the, we're working with the NCBE and IELTS on that. Okay, so, so, the, so it's not just the development of rubrics and the simulations, right. but also the, yeah, because that's yeah. really as critical a component of it as in fact, yes. I would say it's even more critical than probably the other areas are. Right. Um, and um, so then on the portfolios, uh, the, the board is itself retaining responsibility for uh, evaluating those. Yeah. And I assume that there would be rubrics as well for that. Yes. And, and um, so one uh, question I have, again, related to training, um, the people who would be doing that for the board um, would be trained in, in the rubrics and how they're applied and how to evaluate what they're seeing. Yes, just the same way we train them now um, to grade the bar exam. 
and how to apply those, what we get from the NCBE and we all have to go to training for each question we do, I, we would envision the same type of training for these individuals. And how many people go through, um, or do you, I mean, as somebody asked that before and the answer wasn't really a, a number, uh, I, but do you anticipate um, dozens or hundreds or thousands? So it won't be thousands because we just don't even have a thousand people applying for our bar each year. Um, I think uh, I, I would see, you know, where we anticipate and again, who knows, uh, we have 700 people who sit for the bar about every year. And I were kind of expecting as the programs ramp up a third, a third, of, we would expect maybe a third in each bucket. That's helpful. So it makes that uh, training process and the subjective scoring models reasonable. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. So, well, thank you. Thank you. Alex Chan. Hi, Joanne, I got questions for you. Uh, my understanding of the Daniel Webster program is that it caps the number of applicants to maybe 10 to 15 students. So I think the director sort of spoke about the program and I think the school sort of prides itself in having such a small group to maximize learning and mentorship to students. Not to mention, of course, it's much easier to supervise and manage in such a small group setting. So my question is, when we apply that type of a program to an applicant pool with more than 10,000 applicants, such as what we have and typically encounters in California, what scaling issue, if any, do you foresee that we should consider and tackle early on to avoid potential collapse of such a program during its implementation? Yeah, that's a great question. And one we're grappling with in Oregon at a very different scale. Again, right, we're, we're never going to have thousands of applicants. Um, but it, we are trying to take the Daniel Webster's program and say, okay, you license 20 people a year this way. We want ultimately the schools to be available, this to be available to anyone who wants it. Again, we don't think that's going to be every person, um, but anyone in a program who wants it. We are going to ramp that up, though. We are not expecting schools in 2023, 2024, probably any of the 2020s to say this program's available to anyone. I think we will start with smaller cohorts um, of maybe that 15, 20, 30 people going through the program those first couple of years and build on it. Um, I think in a state like California, you may have to start with a couple schools versus every school. I, I don't. Um, we're taking Daniel Webster's where they have one school and saying, we're confident we can do it with three. I don't know how many law schools you all have, but I know it's a lot more than three. And I'm not, I do think, I think a ramp up period is necessary, quite honestly. Thank you. Um, when you, I think when you said one third and one third and starting with a small cohort, what criteria um, do you have in mind in selecting or choosing who may be qualified to, to participate in this program? Because essentially one thing, just looking at it, it sounds like we could potentially be facing inequitable or fairness issue when you're not allowing everyone to apply this program. So how do you anticipate fighting these types of issues that are probably inherent when you have a, a, such a small cohort? Yeah, so at this point, our thinking is that it will be up to the law schools, but with guidance the law schools will ultimately get to decide who enters these programs, but with parameters. And we don't think it should be grade based necessarily. You know, it's not the top 20 kids from your 1L year students, not kids, they're not kids, um, uh, who get to be in this program. Um, but we've not, uh, at this point, I think the expectation is we will ask the law schools to try to think this through and come to the meetings with what they would propose and then we, that, and we'll go from there. Um, Cause I think the law schools better than at least me as a practicing lawyer who hasn't been in law school in over a decade have, an, have a sense of how they would think about equitably choosing these applicants. I think because we are also recommending the supervised practice model, again, we see it as that three-legged stool. Um, we're hoping that mitigates some of the equity issues cause we, we're saying, look, you can still choose the bar or supervised practice even if you didn't get into this program. Thank you. Emily. 
Thank you so much, Joanna. Um, I, you may have covered some of this, so forgive me, but I wondered if you could talk about how um, you all are thinking about the um, sort of potential disparate impacts based on race, gender, class, socioeconomic background, um, and just to sort of put a finer point on it, Oregon has a lot more uh, white <laughs> law students than California does, um, and a lot more white attorneys than California does, although not by much. Um, so I'm just kind of wondering what you've looked at as far as, you know, will, will there be an impact on students of, of color trying to access these programs or applicants of color? Um, are there gender differences that might be a problem? I just wondered if, if that's a road you're, you've yet gone down or will continue to. Yeah, it's certainly something we're going to continue looking at. It certainly has been forefront of the mind, our minds from the beginning. Um, we are a problematically homogenous state, right? That is uh, fair to say, and legal market, I think. Um, one of the big driving forces, or, or one of the things that stood out to us as we were, I think it was in the same week as we released our report, was that ABA study about the disparate bar passage rates. Um, and that just made us say, oh my gosh, the work we're doing is so much more critical, even more critical right now. Um, one big area of concern for us was supervised practice, because the big problems we hear out of Canada is, unsurprisingly, the third generation lawyer who tends to be white has the connection to the law firm to get a supervisor. And that was why we said this cannot be our only alternative pathway. Again, going back to that three-legged stool, we said we can't. It, it should be an option, but it can't be our only option because um, the reports out of Canada were really troubling. The reports out of Canada also for supervised practice were troubling in that they're um, it creates situations right for abuse, right? If you are tied to this supervisor, um, even if we're saying you have to pay them and you have to pay them fairly. There's an instance of sexual harassment, but oh my gosh, do I report it and blow up my articling year, or do I just sit quietly and stomach this out? So we one thing we put into the supervised practice policy is that people are going to have to be allowed to have multiple supervisors. That they that there is there has to be an exit ramp in case of situations of abuse, and that of course we would expect to, we would want abuse to be reported to the um, to the bar. Uh, in terms of the OEP, our hope is that it actually benefits, as it becomes available, particularly to more applicants, um, as that ramp up happens, having applicants um, to the bar or, or now a newly admitted members who are actually learning in law school how to practice law, our, the information we got out of Daniel Webster's is that those um, new lawyers are way more attractive in the legal market. And so you have um, the first generation lawyer who's never been inside of a courtroom before law school, really learning how to practice, they become more marketable upon graduation is our hope. And that, you know, I will admit my own privilege. My father was a criminal defense attorney and I grew up around courtrooms. And so there was a lot of comfort there that I took that privilege with me through law school. And our hope is that a program like this, where we're focused on practical skills, will actually help applicants um, be better lawyers right out of the gate and be more marketable in the legal community. The Dean, Dean Brangolini from Willamette, thinks that this will also help change um, admission standards to some degree. That we can, if, if, if the law schools, at least in his mind, are not so focused on I need to get my students pa to pass the standardized exam, the bar at the end of this. And therefore I'm gonna put a lot of emphasis on the LSAT because there is a correlation between LSAT and bar passage that he's hoping that at least at Willamette, his plan is to implement more holistic admissions practices, which again, may be, um, as we de-emphasize standardized testing, we're hoping will also address some of the racial issues we see. Thank you so much. And I have one more question. Um, have you, and I understand you've talked with um, the Dean at Willamette, I'm wondering about the Dean uh, or um, people at Lewis and Clark and University of Oregon and kind of what they're envisioning or if you know what the cost, actual financial cost to law schools might be to ramp up an OEP program 
and to ensure that all of their students have access to it? Um, so we're in, we're, we're in, we're talking to everyone. Uh, Dean Galini is the most gung ho. And so he, but, but everyone has a seat at the table. Um, and I have heard concerns, right? That this is going to be, um, you know, uh, multiple hundred thousands of dollars to ramp up. Um, but um, I haven't heard that as a roadblock, I guess I would say. No, they've said, look, to, and this is particularly when we're talking about, this is why we have to ramp up, right? We can't, we don't have that money to do it right away, but none of the law schools have come to us and said, this is gonna to be too expensive, we're out. Everyone's still excited to have a seat at the table, but it will, it will cost the law schools because those simulation-based courses and clinics are more expensive than a class when you can have one professor teaching 60 students. Yeah. Um, and I actually, I presented at IELTS and the Dean of University of Denver also made that point of, you know, this is just expensive for law students. And um, we have to make sure that that cost doesn't get passed on and increase tuition to law students somehow. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Can I, I'm just gonna interrupt one, Quick second, uh, do you know yet what the costs will be for the assessment products developed by NCBE and IELTS? So um, all of their work at this point for us is volunteer partnership. Okay. <laughs> that resource sounds good. Yes, that is a very <laughs> helpful resource we have right now. Um, it Quite honestly, we would not have the funds to it, it, this is going to be an expensive endeavor. And, and so we're very lucky to have their, their agreement and partnership on this. Uh, Alex, is that um, a new hand or you're just still up from the last time? Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Mylan? <clears throat> Sorry, uh, following on, on um, Emily's question, is, has there been any conversation about um, funds flowing from the bar or the state to the law schools to support all of the costs you're envisioning? There has not been at all a suggestion and the law schools haven't asked for it. Um, I hope they're not listening. No. <laughs> uh, we, they, they have not suggested that they would need, need funds from the bar to make this happen. I think they all see this as a ultimately a good thing for their law school and a recruiting tool. Okay, I'm looking around our virtual room. Any additional hands? This has been a really great discussion. It's really wonderful to have you back after uh, a few months where things are shaping up more. It's, it's fascinating. I really appreciate you making the time. Um, I really appreciate it because I'm getting ideas from all your questions. This is like my first round of a listening session, right? Your questions are really good. And um, I'm going to close out of here and take some notes to make sure I'm bringing them back to my group as well. Thank you so much for your time today. And um, we might call on you again. <laughs> yeah. It would be great to find ways to collaborate going forward. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you all. Um, all right, I'm turning it over to myself <laughs> for uh, the next few items. But I, before I start talking really briefly about the Daniel Webster program that we've talked about before, I just want to make sure in terms of scale, uh, and I keep showing this chart every time we meet, I think, but what we're looking at, um, especially with the population of California law schools. So yes, we might have the total population of exam takers every year. And again, this is 20 years of like uniques. So it's not how many people you know, are repeating, um, how many uh, unique applicants we have every year. It's not 10,000 in the California law schools. It's more, uh, more like 4,000 um, unique applicants who are taking the bar exam every year. I just wanted to make sure, not, not that that still is obviously a totally different scale than 700, but I just wanted to make sure I reflected that back to you again. Okay, so um, we had, Courtney Brooks, the director, come before uh, with the Daniel Webster program. And I have her slides. I'm going to, because um, Joanna did such a great job sort of recapping some of Daniel Webster, I just wanted to quickly go through this again for comparison. Um, 
So the Daniel Webster scholars are at the University of New Hampshire. They do the first year, the 1L year, the same, same as everyone else. And then there's an application process. And in the last two years of law school, um, it's actually 24 uh, scholars uh, every year go through 2L and 3L on a track, uh, the Daniel Webster scholar track, which has six Daniel Webster scholar specific courses, four electives, six credits of clinic and or externship. You have to have a minimum GPA 3.0 and then there's this uh, very personalized bar examiner portfolio review. So um, these are those classes that are unique to the Daniel Webster scholars, um, especially what um, Joanna was mentioning about that problem solving and client counseling capstone that happens in the spring of the 3L year. Um, these are those special courses. This is the upper level courses that all uh, University of New Hampshire law students take. And then um, some recommended upper level courses. Uh, the Daniel Webster scholars do those simulations that um, Joanna was talking about, a whole, uh, whole robust list of possible simulations. And um, probably many of you know more about what this exactly means than I do, um, but a real, you know, it's a real world experience. Their supervised practice because they have these experiences within the program where they might go to this uh, domestic violence organization and work or they work in in-house clinics or they work in their externships so they kind of view that part of the program as supervised practice. Um, how do they learn there's lots of feedback constant feedback from professors peers judges outside lawyers everything through the program exam uh, the bar examiners in New Hampshire evaluate them they do a lot of uh, reflecting in journals and papers. And the assessments, there's lots of very detailed, and the program has been um, in place since 2005. So there's lots of clear and detailed learning goals. There's formative assessments along the way. There's assumptive assessments along the way of progress. There's that whole portfolio review, interviews. Um, they actually meet in person with the signed bar examiners at the end of each semester. And then they have evaluations from those clients um, in the program. So this is, uh, I put this chart together, but Joanna said it was accurate. So the major difference is, is um, you have to apply to be a Daniel Webster scholar. In the application, the, the um, students who rise to the top are not the top class. It's um, along different vectors where they select people for the Daniel Webster scholars. It's 24 students a year. It is a small cohort. And then again, the bar examiners um, each get five Daniel Webster scholars to um, look at their work product and to meet with them personally on a schedule over two years. So um, what Oregon is working for is that the law students can choose to enter the program. There won't eventually be an application process, although um, you heard Joanna say that there will be some sort of a phase in to this program through the law schools. It's not limited. It's not going to be limited to a small subset in the end. The end inter iteration is the idea that it will be open. And then the design for assessment is periodic work products assessed that will be uh, hopefully with this partnership between the NCBE and IELTS calibrated, scored, and valid and reliable. So um, in terms of scaling the Daniel Webster Scholar Program, looking at the numbers we have in California, there's not going to be an idea that our, our committee of bar examiners will meet personally and review work product with a subset of students. That wouldn't be something scalable that we would do. So I just wanted to review that really quickly. And again, Joanna did a great job uh, speaking about it and, and so did Alex with this question. Did anyone have any comments about the Daniel Webster Scholar Program? Oh, Dean Gardena. Yeah, I just had a quick clarification question because I, I think I, I may have misunderstood. When Joanna started her conversation, she did say that the student gets to decide how to present their competency. So it was student choice and that was, uh, in part to reduce on, uh, the, to help with that, that equity issue that we're talking about. Yeah. Later, I think when Alex asked a question about how do you manage the equity issue, she seemed to suggest that law schools would have some control over who goes into what pathway. So is it completely student choice? I think what the, the how it's shaping up now is that they want to start small and that will be the onus will be on the law schools to decide how do we do this so yes i think the 
the end iteration will be that the student can decide I want to do the experiential pathway or I don't. Okay. But in order to ramp it up, they're relying on the law schools to decide. Got it. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Um, more me. I'm going to talk about the framework that hopefully everyone saw posted. Um, Okay, and I may, if, if you're raising your hand along the way, because I'm sharing my screen, I may not be able to see it. So um, just say something, because <laughs> we are going to talk a lot along the way. So please just say something to me so I don't um, just uh, miss your hand. Uh, so I uh, posted, based on all of our prior meetings and discussions, I posted a draft framework for discussion in it. Oops. Um, for us to talk about. Um, and where is my, I had a, a picture of it. Where is it? Sorry, give me one second. If not, I'll have to just share it otherwise. Okay, sorry. I think for some reason in slideshow, it doesn't want to uh, show what I made. So sorry if this is blurry or this way. Um, so back last fall, we talked about what the Blue Ribbon Commission guiding principles will be um, for all our work. So I put that um, as a reminder over here on the left. Um, and I'm sure you've all remembered these from the meetings last fall about, um, about entry level practice, about minimum competence, professional ethics, professional responsibility, um, public protection, evidence-based recommended uh, exams or exam alternatives, fairness and equity, um, and then uh, minimizing disparate performance. So these are the guiding principles to keep in mind as we go through and talk about the framework all together. And then at the top here, I had that motion from March about what is the work that we're doing. We're continuing to, continuing to develop an alternative non-exam pathway based on the CAPA recommendations. Okay. Um, so I, what I did, if you're following along with what I posted, is taking part, I'm just taking parts of the framework for us to kind of um, analyze piece by piece. So exam, again, we're looking at the non-exam pathway, and what we talked about today is uh, beginning in law schools, so regulated pathway curriculum based on CAPA recommendations. Um, as you'll recall from our April co conversation, we talked about these legal topics that CAPA recommended administrative law and procedure, civil procedure, constitutional law, contracts, criminal law and procedure, evidence, real property, and torts. So um, this was the motion that we had from April. Oh, I think I, I can see. It says Jackie Gardena raised a hand. Dean Gardena? Yeah, no, I'm going to put it down for a moment, let you complete, and then I'll, I'll follow up. Thanks. Oh, okay, perfect. I can't actually see your face, so that's good. Thank you. Um, so this is what we had from April about the CAPA recommendations and the exam pathway. Um, like we talked about at the top of the meeting, we're going to actually have these uh, motions come back to you as part of the recommendations in the June meeting. But this is the draft motion I would have for your consideration that a non-exam pathway in California would be based on the exact same legal topics. Any, any questions there? Okay. Um, and then we talked about the skills based on the CAPA recommendations, drafting and writing, research and investigation, issue spotting, fact gathering, counsel advice, litigation, communication, client relationship, negotiation and dispute resolution. Um, so in our April meeting about the exam pathway, we talked about incorporating these recommendations on skills from CAPA into the exam. My draft motion for your consideration in June is that that would be the same and we would apply that in the same way to a non-exam pathway. Any questions on skills? Okay. All right, so again, I'm breaking down. If, you're, <laughs> if you have the framework somewhere also up on your desk or printed out, I'm just going back down through that column about uh, the law school. So 
uh, the non-exam pathway begins in law school's combination of doctrinal and experiential learning. Um, we also talked at our last meeting on the exam about the exam pathway being more skills-based and less memorization. Um, and this was the motion from, um, except it was about exams, this motion um, from, oops, from April was about the emphasis um, de-emphasizing the need for memorization of doctrinal law, and then um, the development and the weight of the content knowledge versus skills. So this is what we had. I've drafted it for June based on that the assumptions and the premises will be the same as we continue down the non-exam pathway. And again, uh, we'll bring that back uh, to the group for your recommendation in June. But that's just a preview of the draft motion, making these assumptions about how we discussed the exam pathway last meeting. Any questions here? Okay. Um, all right, so the law school implementation as we proceed should include options for experiential education, clinics, practica, simulations, and internships or externships. Um, this is again the, the italicized parts right from that framework work product reviewed by independent regulator or other assessment at dedicated intervals during the pathway. So this is sort of how um, in talking to Joanna myself prepping for this meeting, how I have um, framed this conversation and thought it would be helpful to share. So the, the bar exam is a series of assessment products delivered over two days. What we're talking about this non exam pathway is a series of assessment products delivered over one to two years. So in New Hampshire, the Daniel Webster scholars, it's considered a two year bar exam. So this has been helpful in terms of my own framing and lens. Um, so I put that out there, what we're looking at in terms of this work product review over time, and how we work towards those valid and reliable assessments. Okay. Um, so where we might differ from Oregon and what is up for a lot of conversation today is post-law school requirements. I have there in that um, middle blue column. Yes, Emily. So I just wanna clarify by your comment of what is now up for discussion and may have a lot of discussion. For me, what you just went over as far as law schools is up for a lot of discussion. Oh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so I yes. just wanted to make sure I'm not missing that opportunity no. by being silent at the moment. <laughs> no, 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 actually, that's actually perfect. It's This is all up for discussion. It's completely draft framework. I just know based on um, our prior conversations and what Oregon has um, concluded, I just know that supervised practice is something we are all going to discuss. But by all means, it's all up for discussion completely um, draft and if, if we want to go, I, I'm not sure exactly the best way um, because I have a lot of slides because the framework is quite dense that I put together. So maybe it's best to take it uh, piece by piece and talk about this piece now. And I'm fine. I'm fine doing that. So if we want to talk about the law school kind of column first, um, we can do that. I can stop sharing and we can talk about no, what I, 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 I well. I mean, you can do it, obviously, what you want to do. But I, I, I would just say that when we talked about this before, I voted yes to a motion that would sort of continue our discussions of these. Yes. And but I had not wedded myself to a three legged stool or a law school start first or whatever. So I just I, I think this is all very helpful to frame it. I just yes. wanted to kind of clarify on process that we're going to have a lot of these discussions. but. Ultimately, am I correct that we could still make the recommendation that a non-exam pathway is not viable in California? Is that yeah. correct? Yeah, so I have taken, just trying to, to organize, right? So what we've talked about, what we've heard from other um, jurisdictions and from Canada, I've taken that and, and made this framework for us to completely discuss, pick apart, uh, recommend, and, and, and in June, I can come back with something that looks different. I can, we can come back with a totally different recommendation to not continue to pursue. Yes, all of that is absolutely the work of the commission. And I'm very sorry if I um, just in my, my going through my own slides didn't represent that correctly. No, you're, you're great. You're always great. Thank you. <laughs> I, I would say continue on and then however you wanna talk about it. Thank you. I just okay. wanted those clarifications. Thanks. Does anyone else wanna do, talk now about that first column on, on law schools? 
I'm happy to, to go through and then we can go back over, maybe maybe do a few more and well, just stop me. Cause I get, it turns out it does have a little note. It just don't see your hand. It has a little note for me. So I will, I will and, be. <laughs> well, Audrey, just, and maybe this is just a process question. I think going back to Emily's point about understand you're, you're presenting an overview of the various pathways that currently exist. Um, Oregon is working on it, the mm -hmm. Daniel Webster. Um, and then we're gonna discuss it as a whole, or do you want to stop and say, what about this law school pathway? Um, what about this supervised pathway? So what? how are you imagining the conversation progressing? Um, yes, yeah, so I have actually, and I was like, where is it? I had. I had a slide that had some discussion questions on it. So it actually was my very next one. So this is my own. Um, um, I, I was imagining that you would stop me along the way, which is fine. I have primed the pump with some questions also. We can go back in any way. The, the rest of the time that we have for all this robust discussion, it, I'm very open. I just uh, tried to organize um, the conversation. Yeah, because it seems like the Oregon and, and Daniel Webster has a law school component that is distinct from a supervised practice component. Right. Um, and they're building, or Oregon anyway, is building three pathways, two of them new. Um, but we might, if we go in this direction, develop a hybrid or do something different. So I don't know whether we want to go through your entire presentation then stop and say okay what do we think of all these component parts and and is there um, a different way for us to think about it right all right um so i'm for me i'm i'm happy to to kind of go through the entire picture i don't know if others do as well but that um yeah, so and I and so for some reason, um, my slideshow is, is not sharing all my slides. Maybe that was also throwing me off a little. So I'll have to go to the non slideshow view for a second um, and get to. Um, I, I obviously have some discussion questions and open to going back over what is on that framework for um, law schools. And I could just. Um, share that real quickly so we can look at this. So this is what uh, all I've um, looked at so far is this first column oops, about uh, the non-exam pathway in law schools. So doctrinal experiential learning, regulated pathway based on Kappa, the options that law schools would have, and then this idea of work product review. And so this is all, um, this is this first column right here that I've been going over briefly on the slides. And I think what threw me off when I saw the slides is I read that as it begins in law school and then goes to a post law school requirement. So I kind of saw you as presenting a continuum rather than discrete, um, discrete pieces. Um, and I can understand that. Yeah. So it's just kind of combining these is combining possibilities. So are there, are there questions on that first piece? Um, and I know I went through them on the slides about if we're talking about a law school, um, how it, and again, the word begins, it could be begins and ends the way that the Oregon model is. Um, are there questions about that first piece of the law schools or discussion, things to add? So, and again, I will bring it back and um, tweak everything for the June meeting based on our conversations today. Karen? Um, just sort of a, baseline question, which is um, in, in other assessment contexts, it is important that the that the final review not be by existing faculty or known faculty that so for instance, I'm, I'm thinking about like the IB exams and some of the other professional certifications where the ultimate review and passage is by some organization or some group of people who don't know you, right? So it's, an, it's a more anonymous feature, is that something that we think is important here or do we think that we wanna keep that relationship between the degree candidate or the, I'm sorry, the certification candidate and their known faculty and supervisors? I, I'm just, I'm, I'm without information on that. I'm just trying to, in my own mind, sort through if there's an, an optimum 
overarching architecture. In terms of, uh, so designing how the work products will be reviewed over time. Right, I mean, do we want, do we think it's important to build in sort of a, a independent review of a candidate's work product at the end? And if it is, does that then have implications for the, how they progress through this non-exam pathway? Um, how about we go to Dr. Henderson? Is, are you going to, I think, I, I imagine you would address that. That is the reason I raised my hand. Of course, it's not my choice. It's not my decision to decide that we need independent assessors. Um, and don't think that necessarily in the early parts of this that the assessors have to be independent. I think they can be law school faculty who know the students. But then as uh, they get to, the, to approach licensure, um, the, the critical point is with the myriad law schools across the state that licensure implement a consistent benchmark that everybody has to meet a standardized benchmark. And I think that that does mean that the uh, um, examiners or judges or you know whatever we end up calling these good folks um, are gonna have to, um, uh, that, that system would have to have a recusal process so that uh, you could uh, assign uh, individuals uh, uh, to um, these examiners in ways that ensure anonymity and, uh, and then also to address conflict of interest. If as an examiner, I recognize a work product, or if I recognize an individual in any way, that it's my ethical obligation to withdraw, and the system would have to assign that individual and that work product to somebody else. So I, th I think we are, you know, from a practical standpoint, I think the early assessments can reasonably happen in the law schools and, and might uh, be guided by state criteria. But uh, later on, it definitely has to uh, be more objective. Thank you. Dean Gardena? Yeah, I just um, would like to, to encourage us as we think about the law school portion as well as the supervised practice portion um, to think as Kappa as the starting place and a foundation, but not the only thing that would be incorporated into a curriculum. Uh, going back to my question to Oregon, I think creating a curriculum that's client-centered and that has a kind of a human-centered design to it so that we're graduating um, or licensing individuals that are prepared to enter a, a very multicultural, diverse legal practice is, is going to be one of the benefits of having a um, curriculum-based or practice-based non-exam pathway. Um, so I would hope that as if we go forward with the non-exam pathway, that Kappa serves as a foundation, but that we add to the information based on the state bar's obligation regarding public protection. Um, it's a good starting place about knowledge and skills, but it's not the, the only thing that leads to um, uh, potential issues with public protection that we look at access to legal services and some of the issues that the state bar is grappling with there, as well as that kind of diversity and equity issues uh, and inclusion issues. That's it. So let's start with Kappa, but let's not end with Kappa in terms of what the non-exam pathway might include. Um, is um, is that a new hand, Dr. Henderson? I don't think Alex, your, your hand was up first. Maybe uh, go ahead, Alex Chan. Thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up on um, Dr. Henderson's um, remarks. I, as a member of the Committee of Bar Examiners, I, 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 I'm having some trouble sort of perceiving or even conceiving the idea that each member of the committee would have to look through and make the independent assessment of each applicant's um, um, uh, uh, benchmark. Uh, it, that would be a huge burden, not just on, on the committee, but also on the entire state bar on its own. 
Uh, but if, you know, if the alternative is perhaps to push that burden to the law school, my follow on questions is this, wouldn't law schools be motivated? I mean, at the end of the day, law schools are, are motivated to graduate and help their students pass the bar exam. There's no question about that. So how do we ensure that law schools apply objective benchmarks to every student to avoid potential equity and fairness issues and also to pass students that aren't or shouldn't be passed Right, because again, there's this inherent bias that you want to pass and, and, and get your students to graduate and, and, and to, to have a good career. How do we avoid potential abuse in this process? I just can't think of any at this moment. But if the, the idea is to push it on the, on, onto the bar examiner or computer bar examiners, I, I just don't know how that could be done. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things and I don't mean to, to step on the hands that are raised, but one of the interesting things since the last time Oregon has come is that now they have this partnership with IELTS and with the NCBE to develop uh, integrating along the way these assessment products for an alternative pathway to licensure. And I think that um, that is something where if they have these valid and reliable assessments along the way developed by the NCBE and IELTS, that that would be something, I mean, it's not scalable the way that Daniel Webster does it in our, in our circumstance, right? Even, even with only 4,000 California law school students taking the bar exam, not 10,000, but 4,000, it's not scalable, even a, a third of that or whoever might choose it. But uh, developing these assessment products to integrate into an alternate path, I think um, would alleviate some of those concerns. But um, Mylin. Thanks, Audrey. Um, and this is a little bit of a process question, I think, again, and I'm a I think I'm caught by surprise at um the what we are i'm not sure whether we're supposed to be discussing the details of what was laid out in the um slides right now um and getting into that sort of nitty gritty um which we probably ought to do at some point um and so that's one thing and then the other as i was very much struck by how closely uh the three law schools um were collaborating with um, the the bar in Oregon, and that they were uh, fully involved, and their leaders were fully involved in the process from the beginning. And um, I'm here, you know, I am a faculty member of a law school, and we have um, lots of excellent representation on this commission. But I'm just wondering whether uh law schools need to law school leadership and generally needs to be brought into our process a, a little bit more intentionally and thoroughly uh, so that we end up with recommendations that are implementable and palatable to everyone who would be or sufficiently palatable to those who are going to be asked to implement some huge ideas. Thank you. Um, Dr. Henderson? Yeah, thanks. I just wanted to address what Jackie's uh, comments were a few minutes ago about um, the uh, role of the Kappa uh, report and findings in the decision making. I mean, at some point, there will need to be uh, decisions made about uh, how the CAPA will, in fact, uh, drive the assessment process for all of this. Um, the, the, uh, you know, I'm probably the only one in the meeting today who's not an attorney, so um, I uh, say this with a little fear, but um, there's a pretty strong track record of case law um, that uh, positions the basis for licensure and other credentialing examinations um, as, as job analysis or practice analysis, which is what the Kappa is, to stray too far from that for the license, for the elements of this program that drive the yes, no licensure decision would be risky. I think that 
law schools do probably have to be involved. Uh, and, and, you know, the way that I see it is that um, the Kappa would provide a floor uh, foundation for curriculum development to make sure that those aspects of that are that are that basic are are covered. But then their mission goes beyond licensure. Licensure looks at minimum level of proficiency in the practice of law. A law school's objective goes well beyond that. And so I think it's perfectly appropriate for law schools to add to that. One of your slides, Audrey, talked about um, uh, law schools uh, making the, de the decision about weights between knowledge and skill. And I would argue that uh, Kappa has a role in that uh, decision-making process as well. But anyway, that was no question, just, just that. Thank you. Um, and in terms of, of Mylin and your question about at, when, at what point do we have a different kinds of conversation about the detail of like curriculum and specificity? And I think um, we, need to, we need to do a little more of the helicopter decision-making here first or recommending first about um, are we pursuing this alternate path? Is there a path that is in law schools and kind of the shape of that is there, you know, so some more, I think then, and the who's at the table for more of like a curriculum conversation would be, would be post having some of these larger conversations. Yeah, that's my, that's my thinking. And Audrey, as I understand it, it's an alternative pathway. So no law school would be required to implement uh, this particular pathway or change their curriculum to respond to it, although they would in response to the bar exam changes potentially. Right. Is that correct? It, so if we so if we uh, agree to recommend an alternate pathway, but that will have at some point a recommended uh, you know curriculum, then that would be something that if you were going to be in that pathway, you would have to follow that. If curriculum. you wanted that pathway available to your students, you would have to adjust your curriculum and, and what's offered, but it's not required that you do that to create that pathway for your students. No, I don't think we're saying at this point that we are going to require that. This is a good conversation. <laughs> and again, I didn't mean to frame anything in the frame to say that any, it looks so, it, when you have something like that, maybe it looks more written in, in stone. And of course it is not. It's just, what are, what are we working to recommend at, at a high level? Um, do we have more conversation about the first part? About the, and again, I will definitely edit out the word begins about <laughs> the, um, alternate path in the law schools. Um, I think, um, let me see. So maybe I'll, I'll, and again, I'll keep going. And I do have a couple discussion questions that I, I was thinking of and, and Donna also thought of. And then of course we have more discussion to come. And unfortunately, um, so I went over this piece about law schools and these options. And then I just think that these are slides that don't show for some reason, but this was that idea of what experiential education looks like in terms of required courses, oops, from Daniel Webster. This was uh, what simulations looked like in that Daniel Webster program. And then I was uh, borrowed this slide that for some reason won't display in slideshow from um, Loyola, from Susan Bakshin's presentation about what are some of those ideas of choices of clinics and externships and practica that could uh, could be born out of this alternate path that um, could begin in law schools. Um, so I, I, did, I did go over this slide about work product, about this sort of thinking about assessment products over time. Um, and then these are, these are some of the discussion questions that I that didn't show for some reason, but that I'd stopped to come up with um, that Donna and I were brainstorming before this conversation. Hopefully you can see them. And um, we can add more. These are just some of the ones. Can everyone see this okay? I will 
take that as a yes. Okay, so is there is there one law school curriculum or does the school choose to offer the experiential pathway, both the experiential pathway and the exam or just the exam? When does the student opt in? Where does the curriculum diverge? Um, and I think we just answered, we just talked about this question. Do all law school types and law office study have to offer a non-exam pathway? And I think the, um, from what I'm hearing, there would be no have to. Do all law school types and law office study get to offer a non-exam pathway? Does the option belong to the student? And how do we do any of that kind of ramp up or phase in? How do we do that in California? Anyone, we can we can start anywhere or add your own questions. You just This is just a idea of where maybe we wanna take some of the conversation today. Okay. Um, I can't let's see who did raise. I see two participants raise their hands. So one participant, go ahead. <laughs> Emily, go ahead. I was about to say, Jeremy, go ahead. I've already talked, Jeremy, you go. All right. Uh, I was just gonna say, I mean, I think, you know, last meeting, right, we, we recommended that we were gonna expand some of the topics on the bar exam for more of this experiential or um, sort of practical based. So I think it makes sense that we would have law schools, you know, have curriculum that teaches to that, because if we're going to test on it, right? So that would be my one comment, um, you know, going towards the exam, having the exam, if we're going to, you know, since we're going to have the exam, I think we should, uh, if we decide to do that, right, that uh, we would have curriculum that goes to that. So I don't know if that's what the question was, was sort of leaning towards, but um, at least that's sort of where, where it's at in my mind. If we're going to require it, we should um, we should have the proper education for it. So I, I was just going to say, I, I really do like the idea of having kind of what Jeremy just said. I, I like the idea of having the coursework component to the non-exam pathway be based on CAPA recommendations as well. That makes good sense to me. Um, I just sort of wanted to comment about law schools in general and what I think there might be some. So this is a little bit of just Emily's musings for a moment, so forgive me. There's been long discussion about the fact that the 3L year is a little bit wasted and that in a lot of law schools, the first year is where uh, everybody sort of takes the same curriculum. The second year is kind of where students find themselves. And by the third year, they're still sort of, you know, finding courses to take and things they like, but that really tends to be a practical year. Um, people are a lot of times working outside of law school. Um, they're, they've found kind of where they might want to work, whether it's a law firm or a public agency or whatever. And so it, 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 I think it does nicely lend itself to the third year and especially the last semester to some type of experiential full-time experience if we, if we needed to do that. So I guess I, I wanna just add into the mix that um, I, I'm not yet a fan of this idea for a variety of reasons that we don't need to talk about yet, but, I'm, but I wanna be open to it. And I think part of what I'm trying to do is meld the fact that there are law professors across the country and definitely in California who do think that we are already teaching students how to be lawyers simply in the classroom without necessarily the practical component. Whether or not we agree with that or not, there is going to be some pushback from faculty and from campuses generally to say, look, a lot of what we're teaching, we still need to teach in order to get our students, quote unquote, to think like lawyers. So rather than having sort of this one to two year program that's being assessed where it's you know all of these semesters, I would just float in the idea that if there is the ability for the coursework component and the skills component to be truncated and maybe your last semester is the option to complete these things or something like that, I would just, put that out as, as part of this, that that might be a, 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 a way to do that for some of the law schools that are really still committed to the core curriculum. Um, 
So that was, I think that's it. So I wanted to say at the moment. Any other um, hands sort of on this first bullet point, Dean Gardena? I'm sorry, I can't stop talking and I apologize to, to everyone for that. But I, I do want to just reorient our lens a little bit because I, I think what happens is we get very law school focused. Um, and I'm just wondering if we, if we took the lens off of the law school um, and ask the question of what's best for the public and designed backwards, this is an, an opportunity for us to not just say, what can we fit into a traditional law school curriculum, um, but rather what should law school look like to actually serve the client, to serve the public. And so I recognize that there's lots of resistance to that. I recognize that entire uh, law schools are built on a particular model. But this commission isn't about that. It's about designing a licensing process that can best serve the public. So the question for me is not will it fit within the traditional law school or how will it fit within the traditional law school, but what's best for the public Let's design it. And then if we have to amend it in order to, to address the realities in which we live, that happens. But I hope that we won't allow those obstacles to interfere with creativity um, and allow ourselves to actually imagine, is there a way for us to ensure that attorneys, new attorneys are competent and that they're serving the public and that they're addressing access to legal um, services and that the, the diversity of the legal profession reflects the diversity of um, the, the people that they're serving. And so I, I'd like to start with the premise of, of that rather than backing in around the law schools of themselves. Okay, and I might circle back to that um, after. Uh, Leah, go ahead. Yeah, it's just that was really inspiring, Jackie. I just wonder, you know, what that means um, <laughs> in, in your view, because when we've been talking about this internally, I've landed on the non-exam pathway kind of being grounded in the law schools from really a practical um, or pragmatic perspective that the a model that's entirely post-graduation, I think is very difficult financially for the whoever's participating who needs to make a living while they're doing this. And it, it has all sorts of equity implications as we've discussed in terms of people trying to find their supervised practice um, experience. So if you think about it, like these are our two options and maybe you've got another one, but if those are our two options, it's essentially based in the law school or it begins post-law uh, post law school, then I'm leaning in favor of a program that is uh, grounded or oriented in the law schools. Um, but so, I, so I'm just curious to hear, you know, if you could wave your magic wand, what would this pathway look like? Yeah, I don't have all the answers to that, but what I do hope we do is, is design a value proposition that we think serves the public and then create, um, create that value system. And then we see how do we need to adjust it as we bring stakeholders in? And maybe that's not the job of this commission. Maybe that's the job of, of the next. But I think what we, we put the, the cart ahead of the horse when we say, I don't think this is going to work because of the status quo and the status and that resistance. And what I'd like to do is say, all right, what does it need to look like? In the best possible world, what would this look like? What is, what would we design for the next generation licensing? Um, and we haven't gotten that conversation yet because of the, the status quo mindset. And, and I don't, I, I apologize. I just feel really passionate about this, as well as the idea that higher education and legal education is, is stuck in the 20th century. And we are in the 21st century knowledge economy in which knowledge and technology is rapidly expanding. Lawyers need to be prepared to live in that society. 
and, and existing in a 20th century curriculum and a 20th century licensing regime isn't going to prepare students for the realities of practice in the 21st century, um, in the next five years, 10 years, 15 years. Let's create something that isn't grounded in the past, but actually is looking towards the future. What would that be? Okay, sorry. No, don't, I don't think you should say, sorry, but, but what would that be? If we're going to take another step back, um, what well, isn't this a great opportunity yeah. to have that conversation? <laughs> and it could be that we start with what we have, which is we know um, that there might need to be a classroom component. We know that active learning and you know, what's the pedagogical approach? What's um, the, the, you know, the content approach? What is it that we need to do is the conversation we should be having. Um, Kappa gave us a good starting place. But what else should be included? And then how do we best meet those goals? Emily? So I absolutely agree with Jackie that we are actually teaching a lot of law students the way the same way we did in the 1800s. <laughs> and it, it, it is atrocious. I'm, and so I, I am the first to say let's reform law schools. But I don't think this commission is designed to reform law schools. And so when we're talking about how do we protect the public, um, I don't know that we're not actually protecting the public now with what we have. I think we, we may actually be hindering some viable candidates for um, attorney licensure, but I still think we're probably protecting the public. Um, but I will say that, you know, on to Jackie's point, I do think we should be creative on this. I don't think that we should be you know, well, this is what Oregon does and this is what New Hampshire does. So we, these are the two models we have. I think that they're actually good models to, to, to look at. But I also know that Jackie and Susan gave great presentations about the, some of the things that their law schools are doing. My fear is, again, and I don't, I, I, I am not always um, a preacher of the status quo, but I do think that we're going to run into some issues if we start to say, we're going to completely revamp how law schools operate based on the California bar exam because, or, or process licensure, um, because that is a lot of law schools to move and a lot of people to move that have been doing this as we've just said for 200 plus years. So that is not to say we shouldn't have those goals and that we should you know, uh, uh, try to achieve what we can um, and also structure our, if we're going to have a non-exam pathway based on our creative ideas, but also grounded in the practical reality that we will have a lot of folks that are used to certain ways of doing things. But law schools are used to clinics. They are used to externships. They are used to simulated classes. I mean, we have, I think everybody has a ton of those. So I don't think we're so off the mark. Um, I, I am, again, still worried about putting this all on law schools, uh, but uh, because uh, just the expense right now for a law student, which it will get passed to law students, that's just how this works, um, is it's already expensive. But if we can work with things that we already have, I'm, I'm, I totally understand that. And I guess I, I'm still with Audrey, I, I still don't know what's right. I mean, we've talked about 15 units. We've talked about, you know, a full semester. We've talked about one to two years of doing X, Y, and Z. But I think the devil is going to be in the details. And that is, you know, I don't know if that's what we do right now. <laughs> so. Thank you. Susan? I just wanted to add the point that I agree with a lot of the comments that Emily and Jackie are making about law schools. And I, I see the conflict and the tug of war between, frankly, a great deal of what we're talking about in a non-exam pathway, my school can do tomorrow and is already doing. And so we aren't talking about anything terribly radical. At the same time, by talking about a non-exam pathway, you are talking about something slightly radical because we have been a testing jurisdiction for so long. And so the devil is very much in the details. And the point I wanted to add to the discussion is I agree that the status quo and the level of resistance we're going to face is going to be large. It's going to be large in all facets though. That's not limited to the non-exam pathway. We will have resistance on changing the exam at all as well. So yes, there will be resistance. But my answer to that resistance is that 
I think we have to recognize that it can be overcome as it is being overcome currently in Utah. And for those of you who were at the Mitchell Hamline conference last week or two weeks ago, there was a lot of discussion also about the Utah programs in place on non-exam pathways. Both of those jurisdictions are having a great deal of success by bringing in stakeholders and by getting word out and getting education out there. A lot of this resistance can be met with education. And so I do think what we can expect to face, regardless of what ultimate recommendations this commission comes to, is that resistance is not going to say we can't have an alternative because of that resistance. The resistance, the answer is, we'll answer it. Thank you. Um, I'm just thinking about if we're taking a step back and, and trying to look at um, what really is best for the public and maybe what I put together is too in the weeds and that's totally fair, then what do we need to just kind of have a reset about what what elements do we need to talk again about what elements would an alternative path contain? I'm just trying to think of what the next best way to move the conversation. And if it's, it's not going into the framework, and that's fine with me. This is just a, something based on our prior conversations. But we did have a motion about pursuing this alternate pathway. And I think that we still need to talk about, well, then what is what does that contain if not uh, starting with the law schools? Judge Reeser, you're on mute. I think I can unmute you, maybe not. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll unmute myself, but thank you. Um, we're talking specifically about an alternative pathway to licensure that doesn't require the examination, the bar exam, and a subcategory of that, we are talking about, can this be done in law schools? Mm -hmm. and, and I think we've concluded that based upon programs elsewhere and projects elsewhere, that it can be done. Uh, and I, I agree 100% uh, with Jackie in, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the only thing constant in the world is change. And, you know, law schools are fixed in how they do things. And, you know, people don't become trial judges because they like change. You know, they like stare decisis. They, they like the status quo. But the reality is uh, we need to change because what, we're processing, we've all agreed, I think, uh, to some degree, uh, creates inequities and it's not workable and it doesn't test people for, for what they actually do. And that is learning how to practice law, right? Yes, there are, there are subject matters and, and there's certain people who can take certain types of exam who are good at it, most of us, right? Uh, but but that's not, that doesn't necessarily protect the public and, and the, um, and, and the statistics bear that out. So, you know, create it and it will come, right? In other words, law schools can continue to, can continue if they wish to prepare people for whatever bar exam uh, is ultimately the result of the Supreme Court's determination, you know, hopefully um, based upon our recommendation or not, but, uh, or uh, as we create a, a bar, a, 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 an alternative pathway that involves law schools, the law schools can opt to participate in those or not. Uh, presumably they will because it will attract students, but that's not our job. Our job as Jackie Apley states is to do the right thing and to create the, um, a, a proper mechanism to determine who's qualified to practice law. Right, not who's qualified to talk about Mrs. Paul's graph, but who's qualified to practice law. So, so, so let's just create it. And when we talk about law schools, uh, you know, I was thinking because the conversation over the course of these meetings was, well, gosh, you know, we, we already tell people to take, you know, six units of clinical or 12 units. You know, as I thought it through, I thought, well, you have to spend at least a year, you know, not engaged in these core topics selecting these electives that you may or may not be interested in. Um, but you have to spend at least a year 
you know, learning how to be a lawyer, how to interview a client, how to talk in court, you know, how to, um, how to assess issues and, and help resolve them, negotiate, uh, reach resolution uh, one way or another, right? Uh, either through, through a consensus or through adjudication, or if you're a you know, transactional lawyer, how to, how to move your transactions forward. Um, we, we need to get to that point. And, and, and we're not focused right now on the supervisorial pathway, which, I, uh, which we will need to talk about because that's a whole different analytic because the law schools who are ap you know, capably represented in this group, they're forward thinking, right? How are we going to prepare these students, mostly younger, not all, uh, to uh, to shape their minds to become lawyers? Then, you know, from a perspective of somebody who who works in the remedial world, right, fixing things and not looking forward, uh, you know, I, I I don't crystal ball things when I write opinions, right? I fix things, arguably or hopefully. Uh, we have generations of people who've been to law schools who haven't passed the memory test, who would be fabulous lawyers. And, and, and we, ha we have to include them in somehow in, in this analytic. Are we just gonna ignore the inequity and go, we're just gonna look forward and we'll have a project you know, that'll ultimately be um, complete in five plus years? Or do we, do we wanna address th that problem? And I think we can address both in, in this context, but as it relates to law schools, you know, if we create the paradigm at, in terms of what we want, as Jackie says, to create, the law schools will either follow along or they won't, or they'll disappear or they'll go out of business. And, and I don't mean to be that mercenary with respect to my colleagues here, but that's the reality. You know, law schools will, will do what they need to do to prepare their students to become attorneys or business people with law backgrounds. That's that's my say. Mylin. Um, it, sorry, I'm I'm hesitating because I I don't want to speak out of school. Um, but again, I I think we have great representation from law schools on this commission, but I don't know that we, from a pragmatic standpoint, I don't know that we have the kind of buy-in that we need in order for this to advance to where I would love to see it. I am all in on the non-exam pathway. I do think that, um, the law school option is probably the most responsible, best for the public um, approach. So I'm really looking forward to that. Uh, I don't, I was not part of TFAR, but I was, and I can't tell whether anybody on this, in this meeting was part of that, but my understanding was that there was a good idea that didn't have sufficient buy-in and so it was not ultimately adopted in the form that I would have thought best for law students, law grads, and the public. I don't I don't know what that is. Is there any way you could explain that? Oh sorry. Um was anybody is anybody in this mission a former TFAR member? The task task force on admissions regulation. It, it was a state bar task force that, uh, and I know there are people in the audience who were so much more. I was not involved at all, but it was a recommendation that there be uh, fifteen, I think, or maybe twelve experiential units required to graduate from law school in California, and then it ultimately was turned out to be six and my understanding, sorry to look so blank, thank you, save me, Susan, save me. I don't remember the details. I did not serve on that particular task force, but all I would suggest is that I don't think it's comparable to what we face here. 
Um, because that was a sole curriculum requirement, it was going to require schools to have, to have, and I also don't remember whether it was 12 or 15, it was more experiential units. And there was not buy-in and it was primarily based upon cost concerns and some other concerns as well, but law schools did resist it. And ultimately the ABA six units was adopted instead something lesser. Um, one of the reasons I don't think it's part of a concern for this commission's work is it did not address licensing. And I think uh, Judge Reiser is correct that if we build it, they're coming. Um, because licensure is the goal of the vast majority of law school graduates, arguably even all of them. And because of that, this is not a place where the law schools would have an ability to have um, a lot of, they have a lot of common interests with the state bar and with their students in this regard. Everyone has the same goal. And it is not a situation where the law schools had cost concerns about something that not everybody might want to be doing, I think here. All law schools will want something to do with licensing. And what we are going to look at, I believe, is giving them options. If you don't want to change your law school curriculum at all, you simply do not opt in to the new exam pathways. You teach your old curriculum and your students will take an exam. And if you wish to pursue a non-exam pathway, we build it. They come. They'll decide whether they like it or not and whether the cost is within their realm of it works within their tuition model or it does not. Alex? Yeah, I, I, it's unfortunate because I was hoping that at least one, someone would be um, coming from the non-accredited schools can speak about this. Without a doubt, there are law schools in California that have programs in place to help students hone their skills in both simulated and real settings, right? From counseling clients to working with practicing lawyers, to taking depots or, 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 or appearing in court, it is very clear there are schools that have more than that capability, right, built into the programs. But there are also many schools that don't have that strength, including the non-accredited ones. And there are 16 of them in California. Are we certain that they have the necessary financial and educational infrastructure to implement this pathway? and to provide simulated teaching and to insti institute all of these programs that we just talked about. And if not, are we going to tip that scale in favor of the ABA or California accredited schools and then set the non-accredited ones aside as outsiders looking in? I think Leah hit the nail in the head when she said there are serious equity implications, implications that go beyond just the ABA schools and representatives. And we really have to make sure we don't leave those schools behind, just assuming that they have the financial and the infrastructure in place to implement these programs. That's the one thing, the one voice that we haven't heard and something that we ought to consider in deciding whether this is the best fit going forward. Thanks, Alex, and that was, um that was on the one of my discussion questions too was about law school types you know in california with our three law school types aba cal accredited and registered do they all have to get to offer this pathway and and how how would that work so that's a good question and thank you for bringing it up alex do you have more discussion susan I would just add, I, I too would be concerned that we create a path that is workable at multiple levels. We, we don't want to create a path that privileges the ABA schools, and I say that as someone who's at an ABA school. That's not the goal of this commission. We do want to have access and to all schools, but I think it would be wrong to lump all of the schools in any category together. Um, within the ABA schools, there is a lot of variety in what they will care to do. I think some may not be interested in a practical path. Um, they tend to produce law professors, not lawyers. Those schools are probably not as interested. Um, so I think even within ABA schools, you see differences. I'm sure Jackie can speak to differences within the California accredited schools. And although we do not have a representative here from the registered schools, I think it would be fair to assume that some would be quite interested in a non-exam path and capable of creating one. The cost concerns might actually be something that would be much easier for them because they are so typically small. 
Um, so it may be that we shouldn't assume the cost is a burden necessarily to them so much as it might actually be a more viable path for them based on their size. And I would suggest that we could probably benefit from learning a little more about them, but also that there, I suspect just like ABA, just like California, there's probably great diversity in that pool. Thank you. Alex, is your, do you have more with your hand up? I don't want to miss you. Sorry about that. No, it's okay. I just want to make sure I capture it. Um, this is, again, a really great discussion. And I'm just trying to think about how to frame, well, I can go back to my questions. We also will probably want to take um, a food break <laughs> at some point, um, being humans. Um, so maybe, and again, I'm sorry, this, I have to share this in this strange way, but maybe um, what I would recommend is we can come back to some of these questions after having a uh, time for a lunch break and see if this helps us move um, the conversation forward in terms of what we really are kind of landing on to, to bring back to have more of a recommendation on June 9th. Um, well, Judge Reeser as our de facto <laughs> uh, interim chair, um, how would you feel about 25 minutes at 1225 coming back for? Well, let's let's be humane. What about 32 minutes to 1230? Okay. Does everyone feel okay coming back at 1230? Audrey, Perfect. would you mind leaving those um, that last slide up if that's going to be our starting point when we come back? Sure. Thanks. There's our screenshot. All right. So, so we'll be back at 1230. 1230. Thank you.
Hey, Audrey, are we ready? Uh, let me see here. Wait, maybe till a couple cameras come back on, make sure <clears throat> everyone has returned. Welcome back. I hope that was at least time to eat something. <laughs> they're, they're all just eating dessert and they just don't want to be seen on the screen. <laughs> dessert. Right, because of that extra seven minutes. <laughs> All right. Well, I did leave. So maybe some of you either passively or actively were looking at the questions I left up. Um, so we'll return to that. But while I was eating something, I was also thinking about um, some of the conversation we've had to date and maybe where to take some of the feedback about stepping back and looking maybe again at what's best for the public and and another, is there another design that we can look at? And we certainly, we certainly can. And I would try to um, as we go through this draft framework today, uh, hopefully we might have time to get some more ideas from Jackie or Emily or anyone who wanted to uh, kind of bring up some uh, additional frameworks to consider for the next meeting in June. So I just don't wanna lose any of these threads that we've, we've had so far because I think it's been a really great conversation. So if I could float something, um, sure. Audrey. So, so on, on Audrey's, um, screen that she had left up during the, the, the break, uh, there were some interesting um, suggestions at the very end, which I had not been contemplating in terms of a, a law school experiential pathway, but I had for months been thinking about in terms of a supervised practice pathway. Uh, specifically, uh, when, when Audrey uses the term commitment to practice in legal aid, I was thinking of that as um, commitment to practice in public interest or as a deputy public defender, uh, because that, if that was a supervised practice pathway, you know, that would certainly help a large number of communities in California that are unserved and underserved. Also, the, the next um, point, a bullet point, which Audrey used, she calls it commitment to practice in attorney deserts. I, I would perhaps um, try to redefine attorney deserts. So I looked at my 58 county map and, and you know, thinking forward to a supervised practice pathway, and, and this is completely separate from those uh, resident, I'll call it, uh, practitioners who would be practicing in the public interest sphere. Uh, there are a lot of underserved um, counties. Uh, and, and when I went down the list, I, I, I would include every non-coastal county uh, from Sonoma down to San Diego, 
right, with five exceptions. And the five exceptions would be Alameda, Contra Costa, Solana, Sacramento, and Santa Clara. Uh, because, you know, if, if we think it in those terms, uh, we can be um, proactive in providing legal services where they're not, and, and at the same time, uh, allow those individuals who really should be practicing law, uh, but have been unable to give them options uh, to allow them to become licensed practitioners. So, so I was um, encouraged by Audrey's notes on that because I've been thinking about those concepts as perhaps a, a, a uh, one focus of potential supervised practice pathway. I appreciate that. Um, I will say also these, uh, this whole section here, Donna actually came up with these questions. So <laughs> okay. I'm a credit where credit's due, but um, I appreciate that. And uh, the idea being, how do we ramp up or phase in this alternate path? And, and I appreciate um, your comment. Hopefully I captured it correctly here in the slide. Well, and, and of course there are several coastal counties north of of um, north of Sonoma County, which are underserved as well. Humboldt, Mendocino, and Del Norte. Okay. Um, do we have other thoughts post? lunch on, yes, Susan. To the final point on your slide, Audrey, by student characteristics such as GPA, um, if I understood our presenter from Oregon correctly, she said law schools were giving feedback on what kinds of things they would want on the phase in of the smaller size student groups to begin, mm -hmm. but that they were not going to be permitted to use law school GPA. And I would support and share those kinds of concerns because if we make this a program where only the top 10 or top 20% of students can have access to it, that is not just who is having trouble passing the California bar exam. So if we really want to create a non-exam alternative that provides a true alternative to those who might struggle on the traditional exam, to put a GPA characteristic in on a phase-in program would uh, be a step in the wrong direction. And that, again, in terms of that Daniel Webster Scholars Program is, is not how those scholars are decided by the application either. So um, good point. Um, there's another hand, sorry. Where'd it go? Oh, that would be me, yeah. Charles. Hi, Charles. Hi, um, I was thinking about the uh, possibility of phasing by school type during our break. And it occurred to me that I have a genuine concern that and otherwise, if this commission were to recommend an experiential base to a pathway to licensure, I think an otherwise successfully structured system could be bogged down in its implementation by a perception of pay to play. I believe it was Emily who mentioned the likelihood that we would see higher costs via this license, this pathway to licensure, just due to California scale, meaning we can't rely on, on the percentage of volunteers as we've seen in other jurisdictions and if that does mean that there is a higher cost down going down this pathway the implementation either by aba primarily by aba approved or non-aba accredited schools i think has the potential to be viewed as pay to play if it is successful in creating a higher percentage of applicants being licensed than through the examination-based form. Whether that be if it's implemented through ABA schools that are traditionally larger and more well-funded or through non-ABA schools, which are traditionally not quite so large or well-funded. I think that there's a genuine risk that the need to implement a, a phase in or at least a test group to start such a system on a massive scale if we go through it down that um, method of delineation, ABA or non-BN, ABA could sabotage an otherwise successfully structured program. And 
on an operative basis, I think that at a minimum, we need to be aware of that potential going forwards. And ideally, there should be some sort of structural mechanism integrated into the implementation plan to prevent, at a minimum, just the perception. Because so much of what we're talking about is the ability to uh, make uh, applicants or people who go through that pathway more marketable if there's a perception that they are not as competent due to uh, pay to play perceptions, then it would then it would sabotage the people going through that pathway. So I think that is a concern that should be at a minimum kept in mind going forwards. Thank you. Um, oh, Emily. Uh, so I just as far as like the phase in and and all of that, I, I just for me, I'm still stuck on what the noun exam pathway looks like. Mm -hmm. um, because I think that's going to impact the phase in, right? I mean, if we have a unit requirement, for example, so let's say we have a curriculum requirement and a unit requirement, and the curriculum requirement requires the eight subjects that CAPA recommended and the um, unit requirement requires 30 units in uh, courses certified as um, teaching our six skills, right? So we would have, you'd have 30 units and we have six skills. So you have five units of each. So you've got five units in drafting and writing, five units in negotiations. And I don't, we may, we may have six, I apologize. Whatever it is. Um, if that's the case, and I'm not saying it, it is, but if that's the case, then a ramp up probably is going to be, I would think, would be volunteer of the law school that can handle that, right? Or somebody that is willing to try to do that first and be a pilot or be a model or something. Um, I would not, um, again, this is the law school side. Um, but if we're talking about, well, actually the pathway is going to be, um, you know, something that's more on the student, right, that they are going to have to seek out while in law school, they're going to have to seek out an externship, they're going to have to seek out, um, you know, taking these courses, but they're also going to have to be, they, they're the ones that have to go certify, get certified by this independent process that they're doing this then I think you could have a phase in that is, maybe it's a, it could be an, you know, um, students from each type of law school registered in California and ABA that, you know, you have a pilot program of, you know, 20 students each or something that apply for it. So I guess I, I'm still not certain where we're going with this as far as what actually we would say tests or assures that we are protecting the public and that we are licensing minimally competent attorneys. If we're not testing them, but we are going to say there's this non-exam pathway, we've got to obviously make sure that they have minimum competency as we've defined it. So what does that, now I'm back to again, what does that look like? What are we, what are we putting in place? Is it courses? Is it work in the summer of law school, could that count? I mean, these are the conversations that I, I would like to have. I don't know if it's today, but maybe it's subcommittees or something, but I, I just, I think there's a lot of facets to this and maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's just, look, Emily, it's gonna be what it'll be, and but we've got to figure out the structure first and maybe I'm wrong, but anyway, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Um, so I can see more, more thoughts. Judge Reeser. So Emily, when the Oregon representative was here earlier and she talked about how this, that Supreme Court created what she called licensure development committees and a lot of these fine points would be, um, would be worked out. I, I guess the question you're asking is to what level of detail uh, do we need to address? And is the level of detail necessary now to achieve buy-in from the committee? Right, I think that's the question. That's very well put, George, Judge Reiser, thank you. 
Jackie. Um, I think I was going to say uh, something similar to what the judge said, but also wanted to suggest um, that when I said, let's be creative, it wasn't necessarily like, let's blow up the law school or supervised practice idea as much as when we're thinking about it, let's not be wedded to it. Or let's think about, can they be melded together in some way? And I really like Judge Research's idea about, um, you know, one of the things that we hope to do is close that access to legal services gap. Um, but we don't necessarily want to force people into that pathway if it's not the right fit for them or their families or their life circumstances. But creating it as a pathway, I think, is a really interesting and good idea for what one of the things we're trying to accomplish um, or the state bar has a priority around. Thank you. <clears throat> um, sorry to keep going back and forth, but I think, um, well, let me know if this is correct. So do all law school types and law office study have to offer non-exam pathway? I think we see no based on conversations today. And do they all get to offer do we have a sense or maybe you I can get some more feedback here from the group about if this is a yes. LOS is law office study, just, just so you know. And the law school types, ABA, Cal accredited and registered. And maybe we're not ready to have that more than just the question. Well, I mean, what I've heard is that there's not parity necessarily between who attends which law school and so there at least there at least needs to be some access to um equity access to people uh so whether it's a particular type of whether it's a registered school or a california accredited or an aba accredited uh there has to be parity whatever that determination is Susan, did I see your hand come down? I was just going to say, I think part of it might be clarifying what you mean by get to offer. I think if you mean, do we intend to exclude any particular type of school? Yeah. The answer is no. Okay. Yes, that is. Yeah. Are we going to say this alternate path is open to ABA and Cal accredited schools, at least for the first phase? Uh, Natalie? Maybe I'm. I'm not I, that's not what i understood susan to say i think it's a slightly different it's at this point we're not ready to exclude personally i'm not ready to say that whatever we come up with will absolutely be open to every law school so um for me it's a bit more of a i think i'm more with emily in the sense that it's it's hard for me to wrap my brain around all of this without a little bit more detail but i understand we need to think big picture first. Um, but this question here for me requires a bit more detail to be able to affirmatively say whatever we come up with, it will 100% be offered to all law school types. Okay. All right. Um, yes, Dean Gardena. On that, I just, um, want to make sure that that I understand it. And maybe it's just because uh, this is how I'm thinking about it. I'm imagining that there will be um, requirements placed on law schools who want to take advantage of this non-exam pathway. And they're going to have to create whatever it is that the state bar deems to be necessary to meet the goals of, of licensing, competency, et cetera. If a law school can create that curriculum. And if the law school is graduating students who are successful in meeting those goals, then why would it be limited? Or a, a law office, or, I mean, is the limitation based on, on a presumption about what those law schools are capable of doing? Or, it, it, so I just wanna to try to understand what the limitation what the basis of a limitation would be if a school was able to abide by what the requirements were and its students were graduating um, and, and successful in that licensing path. If they weren't, that's a different question, but um, just want to understand what the concern is about that. Ah, uh, Dali can, yes, go ahead. 
Yeah, so I think the way um, Jackie just phrased that really does help highlight what exactly what I'm struggling with, right? Because I don't know what we are coming up with. And I have zero reason to say this type of law school should be excluded. None at the moment. I think that that's precisely the point. Like, what are we going to come up with? And then that should, that probably will determine who it's available to, who it's not available to, presumably to everyone, if they can meet, just as Jackie said, the requirements we come up with, regardless of law school type. Um, so it's a little bit of this back and forth that I think we keep coming back to a, a bit more information to be able to answer some of these large structural points. And I can see that two people raised their hand, but I can't tell who it is. So, so I'm one of them. This okay. Um, so I, so I think part of it is thinking about from the regulator's perspective, what is the portfolio that the regulator is going to be looking at? Is there at right the framework that Audrey had provided has an a builds an assumption that there is a post uh, post law school supervision requirement, and there would have to be some potentially some matching to supervisors review of work from the supervisors, and so it, it was a capacity question um, that I think necessarily sort of led to the question of well ha have being able to ramp up to be able to handle the capacity um, from a regulator perspective, uh, among other things, um, uh, why we were asking that question about how do, you, how do you phase into this? How do you provide the opportunity for the regulator to be able to review the portfolios and the capstone projects and, and the, the magnitude of that information, do the matching with the supervisors, training the supervisors, creating a, a, a prep program, all of those those things, and that was that was where that angle I think largely came from of of a phase in to ensure that we had the capacity as a regulator to be able to handle people operating through those that pathway. Um, whoever's hand is raised next. Sorry, all I see is that there's two more participants. Uh, so it's Natalie. Quick question: Could the could the criteria to help get you there not be law school specific, but instead maybe a characteristic of the candidate, such as, you know, grads from 2023, 2024, just limit it to graduates from that year. That that would already narrow the scope a little bit, and it doesn't require us to make that that determination based on the law school. Just an idea, because I do understand what you're saying. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, there are hosts of ways to mm -hmm. figure out the phase in, only one of which would be, is it law school type, right? Um, and is there any difference in the capacity of the law schools, whether it be their, their funding, their resources um, to offer the kinds of clinical program simulations, et cetera, um, that, you know, that in and of itself could be a limitation and we just know you're not going to have law, law schools of X type offering it because either, as Susan said, they, they, they produce law professors um, or those that don't have the resources. So you're, there's an automatic sort of limitation on that pool. Um, or, um, uh, or, you know, is it everybody would want to opt into this and to provide this pathway to their, to their students? That was kind of our thinking, like, well, if this is something that's, that everyone's going to want to potentially offer just figuring out what are the possible ways that we that we could phase that in and that's why right some of the other options weren't based on law school it was based on is it is it open only to those who want to practice in the public interest is it right variety of different of different options and so these are just put on the table for you all to respond to and say no it shouldn't be law school type it should be x instead I know there are other hands raised. So, so Audrey, I'll call hands for you because oh. I can see hands. So Jackie is next. Yeah, so um, Donna, when you were changing it to what, what the regulator needs in terms of ramp up, that kind of, I think, changed the lens from how can law schools get prepared to do this to what does a regulator need? And that was helpful. Um, the first thing that came to mind as, as a starting place is when I look at the accreditation 
you get the you have to hand in your material you get provisional and then you come back and you get fully accredited and i'm wondering if there's a way to depending upon what we come up with for a school to establish that they have the resources they have the infrastructure they have everything they need to create this pathway they know how they're doing it um, they get initial or full approval at that point to go forward and maybe it's with a limited cap you can only admit 30 students into this program until it just like we see with some accreditation issues so I think there's at least with those guidelines uh, in the regulations and the ABA has something similar that there might be a place to, to at least start our thinking about that. I'm sorry, I thought I forgot my duty. Karen, <laughs> uh, Karen Silverman is the next with her hand up. Thank you. Um, so I, I think this is actually a very interesting conversation, but I can't help thinking we're skipping a bunch of steps that are going to be more, that are gonna help us inform the answers to all these questions, right? That, that, that it, just, it feels very much that the cart is now before the horse. And I, I think, so I, I'm, I'm just trying to still wrap my mind a bit around the overarching architecture here. So if there's a non-exam pathway, is it one pathway? Is it several pathways? Is, is it, you know, what are the resources we would lean on to achieve that pathway? What are then the ramp up challenges associated with those pathways? So I guess I, I'm, I'm the, the it is still a question to my mind. And what is our process for, for plumbing that a little more exhaustively so that we can then start to see what the edges look like and maybe what some of the design issues are? Because I, I it, it, I think the answers to these questions that are all really good questions are just gonna turn very much on where ultimately we're gonna recommend that we put the pressure on the ultimate certification and and um, sort of the confidence and you know elements of ensuring that that a candidate or a law school or a regulator have successfully navigated the new path. Right, because how we do that will determine how we ramp up and what we need, you know, all that sort of thing. Yeah, and it may be that that's sort of our opening, Karen, that, you know, to, um, to move forward, and I apologize, I missed a sort of chunk of this meeting in the middle, um, but to, to take a look at the, to go back to the discussion framework that was presented um, in the materials today, Understanding that um, that as I as I've heard it, there there are um, right, and this was again this was a discussion framework to start sort of the 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 um, the process is going, but to figure out what the components might look like, um, because what I think we are hearing from you is there need there may need to be several frameworks that come back to mm -hmm. this commission for the June meeting, and and once we finish, I'd like I'd like to go through this one. And say if this is the framework, right, where an, the non-exam pathway begins in law school, let's go through those pieces. And then at the end, I want to say, okay, now it seems like there's a framework that 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 the commission would like us to um, to uh, suss out to bring back at the June meeting that starts somewhere other than law schools. So let's hear from those people who who had that um, that innovation and give us a sense of. What would some of the high level components of that look like so we can suss that out and bring it and bring it back and that's where i think karen we get to the ability to really say okay now that we know this is the framework that that this group is recommending where what are the limitations what are the challenges that's what all of those questions were really about was getting to how does that how do the how are those questions answered in light of the framework that we adopt Okay, and in light of this one framework. So for instance, so with, with a non-exam pathway starting in law school, is there consensus or, or discussion that we wanna have in this group about whether that's just a, a, an alternative curriculum for the final year of law school that's more rigorous and has more testing associated or you know, on, on the ground testing? Do we wanna, can we, can we just say that you know, non, non-exam pathway A, which starts in law school, as opposed to non-exam pathway B that might not, 
you know, is that, is there agreement that that should all be pushed into the third year or are we still debating whether that should? I'm not sure we have agreement on that. And that's, that, and maybe in terms of determining what is cart and what is horse and where are the horses? <laughs> that um, coming back, back to what square one is totally fine um, to talk about that. Square one meaning the, the law school, begins in law schools. Emily? Or were you done, Karen? I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Late on that. <laughs> well, I guess to Karen, I mean, I, I had similar uh, feelings as Karen. I mean, I I, I think I, I'm, I'm fine having the discussion about what it should look like in law school. And, and I think, you know, there's been a lot of discussions of, about that. I guess one other frame that I would like to discuss is what an applicant needs to demonstrate in order to be licensed without taking an exam. So for example, if I'm going to People's College and I'm getting all of the information that I need there, uh, coursework, et cetera, but they don't have the practical training program that is required from the state bar, can I as a People's College graduate or maybe take my third semester, for example, and, and do part-time at People's, but Golden Gate University, for example, law school is, is saying, yeah, we will give you that training and you can do it here and, you know, or you can try the bar once and you didn't pass it, come to Golden Gate and, you know, pay an extra whatever, unfortunately, or, or pro bono, and we'll give you what you need. Can, can we look at a model where it is more on the applicant rather than the law school? And I may be splitting hairs, but because I think that an applicant can, can we, the regulator can track the applicant. The applicant, if there's eight things that someone needs to do for the non-exam pathway, just like there's six things in order to be licensed, they can, over the course of their law school, keep knocking out those things that they need to do to have this, to reach this pinnacle where they have the, the, all of the requirements done. And if they're at a place that doesn't have that, then they maybe have the ability to get that somewhere else and they know, they know that going in. Um, so that's, I guess, the frame, if, there, if, if that even makes sense, uh, that, there, that if, if, if we could look at it from that frame, that also might actually help us with the other law school and then what still needs to be looked at as far as supervising after law school, et cetera. I think that's interesting. It kind of reminds me, we have law office study now, right? Where you can study in judges chambers instead of go to law school. And then there's the first year exam and the bar exam in terms of assessment. So thinking about, could there be a suite of options for licensure for an applicant that's not tethered in the same way that um, is in this draft framework? But I do think this gets back, Audrey, to the points that were in the, I think they were the early slides of your of your of your deck potentially if I'm remembering correctly um, which is right at the last meeting we talked about using Kappa mm -hmm. what the knowledge skills and abilities are um, that um, that establish minimum competence and we talked about it in the context of the exam right what needs to be in the exam to determine that you have established that you have the knowledge skills and abilities that are that are required of an entry level attorney. If, to my way of thinking, those are the same knowledge, skills, and abilities that you need to walk out of a non-exam pathway having. And so, so, so uh, it seems to me that that the requirement is that to offer a non-exam pathway, you have to have a, an approved curriculum that will cr will um, allow people to develop those same knowledge, skills, and abilities in those same content areas, in those same skill areas, because that is what we've determined is necessary for minimum competence, not for an exam, but to be a minimally competent entry-level attorney. And so it, it seems logical to me that those are the, the same requirements. And so it's a question of developing the curriculum that will allow you to gain those skills. And I think maybe it was Natalie that was talking about, about it before, you know, five, five credit hours that, you know, that are in, you know, drafting, um, you know, in drafting and in client counseling and sort of whatever those, those, those uh, skill areas are. Um, so, 
um, so that's kind of the way that I'm looking at it is, is that the curriculum that would need to be approved for this non-exam pathway would need to allow people to develop those KSAs. Um, so may, I mean, I, I don't want, again, in terms of getting too ahead of where there's a lot of outstanding questions and not just the ones I had for discussion, because it seems as we're discussing them, it's, it's opening questions back to that, the very, um, early part of this, this one, uh, possible framework, which is the non-exam pathway beginning in law school. So if there are additional questions that can help um, shape that better and or ideas, that would be great, um, Dean Gardena. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, I wanna make sure that I understand um, what we're trying to accomplish. So one question that we're trying to answer is, does this committee want to recommend a non-exam pathway to the Supreme Court as uh, something that we think um, should be a viable option to graduates of California law schools. I guess where I'm getting confused is, um, are we then also recommending what we think that pathway should look like? Or is that for another uh, committee to go back to the Supreme Court and said, here is our, uh, much like Oregon is here is what we're recommending now based on that. So I, because I, and, the, and, and I think what I'm hearing is some people are saying, well, I can't, I can't get on board with the non-exam pathway unless I understand what the non-exam pathway would look like. But I, I guess I want to understand what exactly is it that the Supreme Court is expecting for us to actually outline the non-exam pathway or simply to recommend whether or not there should be one. So I would certainly never deign to speak for Neil or the court, mm -hmm. um, but this, the, the structure of, um, of the framework that, that, uh, that Audrey put together for the, com the commission's consideration was, um, was intended to sort of get that, the basic information. So not that the court would want, not just, we think there should be a non-exam pathway, but that there should be a non-exam pathway, which generally has these high level components. And so, um, and if we think back again to the um, the decisions that were made, uh, the recommendations that were adopted at the last meeting with regard to the exam, right? We said we're not comfortable saying what percent of the exam should be doctrinal, um, uh, memory based, and what percent of the exam should be testing skills. We are comfortable saying that the focus should be heavily on skills and not on on con content-based knowledge, right? Not on memorization. That may very well be the same kind of thing that we're talking about here, right? We're not saying it's 15 units or 28 units or three units of, of clinics and simulations and externships. And it's definitely simulations and not externships or definitely externships and not simulations. We're not saying that. I think what we're saying is, is there is, you know, it, right? Using Audrey's framework, um, the non-exam pathway starts in law school. There will be a mix of doctrinal and clinical program and um, experiential learning. Um, you know that will um, be you know heavily focused on experiential learning. Um, and uh, and following law school, there will be a supervised practice requirement. Not sure what the hours are that that would be required, but that sort of kind of level is is the, the answers that we were hoping to sort of uh, be able to come to a, a consensus on um, through the discussion of the framework. And that is what we were thinking that we would present to the Supreme Court. And I see Neil has taken his mute off so he can tell me where I have gone astray. No, no, you haven't gone astray in any fashion. I think actually, Don, you did a very good job of sort of summarizing what the court would be looking for moving forward. The only thing I would add to is, is to add some sort of description about feasibility and maybe uh, capacity. Uh, those are the only things that I, I would sort of add on to that. Um, hopefully that's helpful. Yes, Judge Reeser. 
So one thing that, and I was listening closely to Donna, right? One thing that Donna suggested, or at least uh, discussed, was whether this law school pathway, which we know has been in place in New Hampshire in a very, very limited form for way more than a decade, pushing two, uh, is this two-year full-on, you know, I'm not in the core classes, I'm in this how to be a lawyer program. And we know that Oregon is way farther along in the process is studying the questions that we're talking about that we were talking about deferring, but they are, as I heard the speaker earlier, uh, effectively going to recommend that two year full on, you know, after the first year of law school, this, this, is, your, this is your life uh, program. You know, what, what I think what I just heard Donna say was, was, well, whatever it is, we should also have supervisory practice after that. And, and I'm not sure I necessarily buy into that because it really depends on the intensity of the program and, and, and the, the, um, the regulatory aspect, right? How, how, can, uh, how can the state bar assure, uh, you know, quality? Uh, but having said that, right, you create this monster that, you know, you, you gotta have to, it's gonna be with you way past law school. Uh, you're disincentivizing people learning how to be a lawyer. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit concerned about that. Um, and, and on this draft, the post-law school requirement is up for discussion, but again, discussion and not, certainly not where this group might land. Jackie. Um, I think uh, what I would hope is that this group could recommend not 15 credits of this or one semester of that, but the we have the knowledge, abilities, and skills. Um, I think there's some other things that we could also include um, regarding uh, the needs of the public. And then every graduate who wants to use the non-exam pathway has to meet a certain level of competency, obviously, when it relates to this knowledge, ability, and skills. Um, how the school might design the pathway to reach that level of competency could vary from school to school, um, depending upon resources, its student demographic, et cetera, um, allowing for a lot of creativity um, based on the very diverse schools that we have in California. So it seems to me that, that what we want is that there's a minimum level of competency um, but allowing schools to figure out how to help their graduates reach that level of competency could be something that is up for each school to, to establish. Um, because I think there's an opportunity for, um, for lots of different um, ways to reach the same goal. And it, it, it also reduces the homogeneity that is so prevalent in law schools now. Any reaction to, to that, Mylan? My, um, I, I, I guess I'm. Um, I want to go back to. I can't remember who said it. Um, the competencies that are um, required to practice law are the same. Should be the same whether you're on the exam pathway or the non-exam pathway, and whatever pathway within the non-exam pathway, it seems to me, those should be set whatever they are. Then, I agree with Jackie that it ought to be up to the school how they're going to produce someone who has those 
the full set of competencies. But I think the question, the hard part is how do we assess mm -hmm. uniformly so that the competency level is uniform regardless of which pathway, which school, mm -hmm. um, and which course you've taken, right? So to me, that's where the tricky part is, and that's where we need to bring our focus. And I thought that the um, that Joanna from Oregon was saying that they had not yet decided whether they were going to have a uniform across all three schools method of assessment. So I think they may still be struggling with this as well. I think so, but I think what is different now with where they are in development is that they have these two partners, the NCBE and IELTS, that are experts in assessment product development, doing the listening sessions in Oregon to determine how to create those products to assess for this alternate pathway. So I think that is something where um, those partnerships they have right now will really help them answer this question. And I think, Mylan, that um, that you know, part of it goes to yes, those are the knowledge, skills, and abilities. Yes, to your point and Jackie's law schools, law schools have to develop the curriculum that will produce students that possess those knowledge, skills, and abilities, right? And if you fail to do that, right? If everybody that you send to the bar exam or who has their portfolio reviewed by the regulator fails, the law school will change their curriculum, right? So, so the law school gets to sort of create that innovation. There will likely need to be, again, going back to Joanna's presentation, right? She was talking about, so maybe if you've got, you know, you've got this, this simulation and you have to produce a motion and lemonade, that goes to the regulator. So there may be a, some identified products, right? That in throughout your, your experiential work, um, a student needs to produce you know, uh, three of the following five types of documents. They need to, to, um, they need to be prepared to do a client counseling. Going again back to Joanna, right? So, so, so maybe it is sort of. I'm not going to tell you it's in your, it's in your sales tax simulation, um, but, uh, but somewhere in there they need to produce this document. They need to be able to. They need to. And that document becomes part of the portfolio that the regulator looks at. That's kind of how I'm thinking, thinking that that might work to give the flexibility to the law school, but provide some consistency. Um, and now, and you can't tell this on Zoom, now I'm looking at Jim Henderson to provide some, some consistency of the type of product that we're looking at in order to do the assessment of, in comparison, comparing one product, one student's product against another. I think ultimately there has to be some central control over the assessment. And uh, that's the, I mean, it's, there has to be a common benchmark across. I think the difference between whatever the bar exam is gonna look like and this non-exam pathway in terms of assessment is um, the nature of the assessment more than the, the fact that there isn't any kind of assessment at the end that's standardized there. So I'm not quite sure I'm answering your, your question, um, Donna. Um, so I'll, let me stop and give you a chance to correct, you know, advise me. Well, and I, I think there, right, that gets to the, the third slide in uh, the, the third column in, uh, in, the, in the draft discussion framework where we sort of are looking at, are there, you know, is there a prep program or um, other kinds of um, assessments that, that everybody would need to participate in? Is it as, um, as I think Oregon was talking about, it's just, it's the portfolio at the end and their capstone project is, you know, this client counseling with issue spotting. Um, but if there's an assessment like the prep program that we heard about from Oregon doing California performance test, et cetera, 
um, then that would be something that's consistent, that's developed by the regulator that everybody has to take um, in addition to the portfolio of work that comes um, that comes from the law school. And again, that's that's part of the discussion here. What does everybody think we need to see? Um, does the does the pathway end at law school period if it starts there? Um, uh, is it is it followed by a supervised practice requirement? Is it also or in lieu of a supervised practice requirement followed by an assessment of some sort? Um, these are all the all the questions that are that are open for that that we think this group needs to needs to needs to answer needs to provide that sort of level of yes there should should be an assessment and um, you know that would be consistent. We'll figure out in our in our version of a development committee what that would look like, um, but giving the Supreme Court those parameters of you know it would start in in law school. And it would end there, or it would start in law school, and this would be what would be next. Um, that's what we're what we're looking to accomplish. Judge Reeser. So, only the uh, subcommittee that was involved in the non-exam pathway heard this presentation, but there are a number of Canadian provinces that don't have a bar exam, right? But they have this standardized course that's an everyday. You know, you start with you know, meeting clients and, and how to do an attorney client trust account. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's a comprehensive um, preparatory course that covers cradle to grave as best as they can within, I don't know, was it six weeks or whatever the, the course was, but, but it was pretty impressive and it was pretty um, uh, omnibus in terms of uh, the, the kinds of uh, practical information that that needs to be um, part of of moving forward as you know as an attorney and, and so uh, I don't know I mean while I'm not a huge proponent of punishing people in this pathway with another year of supervisory practice because they are going to have their uh, portfolio assessed that kind of a preparatory course would seem to be right in line with what we're talking about and also create some form of standardization uh, between the various law schools so that everyone was being presented with, you know, a, 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 a vetted set of, um, of, of uh, information. It's, it's what I'm showing here, which uh, several Canadian jurisdictions do the practice readiness education program. And these are the phases of that program um, and the varying different hours dedicated to, and a lot of it is in person. And some of it is more modules, self kind of guided interactive modules online. What they call it. When when office. does somebody do this? It, it, so so it was the tail end of their study, right? This was the mm -hmm. last thing they did before they were certified. There's a term they use, I forget, in Canada, but uh, and and no, but it, this was their um, and they do work with law firms there, which is a access issue in California, but uh, this so was- this is concurrent with uh, graduating law school, like they graduate law school and finish the prep yes. program at the same time. And they do the, what they call articling, which is supervised practice. That, that's this, is, this is post-law school. This is immediately post-law school. So they do it, um, right? I mean, maybe some of these things on Word they could do before, I'm not sure, but yes, they do the articling, supervised practice, um, and the prep program concurrently. Susan? I appreciate Donna's characterization of it would help us focus on where does it start and where does it end. And I do believe that we can create a path that starts in law school. I do think the more troubling questions are where does it end? I do think law schools will be capable of building something that meets what they're told to do. Um, but I do have a couple of concerns about these sort of end points. I'm not very troubled by assessment of a portfolio. From what we've heard from Dr. Henderson and others is that we can create a rubric and we can create a way to assess these things in a way that will be sufficient to protect the public and to establish minimum competency. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about 
the supervised practice components. And I was moved today by the Oregon professionals comment about people who pass the bar exam are not burdened with a supervised practice requirement. People who pass the non-exam pathway should not either. And I'm, it, I, I do like Oregon's option of it is supervised path or experiential path. So in an experiential path, I would not favor putting a supervision practice at the end of it. Um, like our friends in Canada who have this regulatory prep program, while it initially looks quite attractive because it is very uniform, I have concerns that we are making our non-exam path an exam. Uh, because you're going to have to assess people's completion of that program. And if all it is is online programs that they have to watch or do, I am not sure that that is going to create the kind of end point to this program that we're looking for. Um, so at least at this point, I think it's helpful to think about what those endpoints are. I would favor the assessment of a portfolio option, at least at this point, based on what we've heard. And I would favor supervised being a different path, not a burden on the experiential path. And as for any regulator created program, I think we have to be careful that it does not become a test. Emily? Uh, assuming we move forward with a non-exam pathway, I would also be in favor of what Susan said, which is to have a portfolio and have that be regulated. Part of my concern with um, anything else is one, if you don't have that, you have a, basically a de facto diploma privilege um, because you're just gonna have law schools that are gonna do what the bar says and here's your 15 units and here you go. And we don't really have anybody that's checking that. So I do like the, the portfolio idea. And then I do think it's a real big access and equity issue if you're having um, some supervisory um, uh, things afterward, directly afterward. I certainly don't mind having some sort of CLE or something that is maybe you know continuing or something. And if you choose the non-exam pathway, you have a year of CLE that's a little more rigorous, rigorous or something like that to make sure that there is some sort of check and balance, but um, anyway, I liked, I, I would support what Susan had said. If this is helpful, I had, um, oh, Jackie, go ahead. Yeah, the only thing that I would add is um, I think the portfolio and, and having that written product because one, it will really orient the students towards practical writing rather than exam, bar exam writing, which is I think one of the things that is lacking. Um, but I do hope, and, and this is where the Daniel Webster kind of capstone simulation at the end, that we're not just testing their kind of writing and analysis skills, but actually putting them in, in a situation where they are um, demonstrating their ability to do some of the other skills that are client-based, um, the client counseling or negotiation. So it, I don't know if it's a capstone or, or how it's assessed, but I do think it's important to not just focus on a written portfolio. And sorry, just to Jackie's point, I agree. And I was not assuming, and maybe, erroneously, I, I think a portfolio should not just be something that's written that you submit, but maybe there's a, some part of that portfolio is demonstrating, here's where I was doing, you know, oral advocacy or working with a client or, you know, something like that, that could be part of that quote unquote portfolio that is presented as a sort of holistic process to the bar. Mylin? Um, I agree on the portfolio with written and then plenty of other types of um, lawyering skills being assessed. What I would add is that I think I'm coming to, to the point where it, I would support, I, I think it, it's better for everybody if that's assessed throughout rather than all at the end. And I, I know that's what Oregon was talking about doing, but just putting my vote in for that rather than having it be sort of a high stakes portfolio review rather than a high stakes bar exam. 
Uh, and then I would also put a plug in for having, I, th I think some piece of that be a live client, real life um, assessment rather than um, only generated uh, simulations. But, but to the extent that the live client in-house clinic is the gold standard for teaching law students how to be practicing lawyers. To me, there's value in ensuring that or something close to that before licensure. Um, and I'm, I was just trying to look at some of the material I have from Oregon because I'm not I'm not sure that they've landed on it being something only at the end because the Daniel Webster Scholars Program is assessed throughout those whole two years. So they they might also be building um, assessment tools to, to integrate throughout. And I, I brought this up in a previous meeting and I sent um, Dr. Henderson some links and, and a contact person, but Western Governors University has been kind of perfecting competency-based assessment for 20 plus years. And it might be interesting to talk to someone there. And in those instances, students continue to work at a particular skill or knowledge base until they have reached that competency level, which is what we're going for here. Um, and so even if a student submits something for the portfolio that is unsuccessful the first time, they would just be told, go back, uh, and perhaps uh, continue to work at it until they meet the competency level. So I think there's an opportunity um, to add perhaps some competency-based education experts into the conversation about assessment. I think that's a great takeaway for me um, to organize for the June meeting is to have maybe someone from IELTS or, or the principal assigned from the NCBE too to talk about some of these uh, ways of assessing um, either that they've already come up with it, that they're in process. And perhaps some of the partners who are already working on some of these alternative pathways. We heard from Claire Solot earlier, but you know, there, there are entities that are out there sort of trying to do some of this work at scale. So. Dr. Henderson. And so one of the entities that's out there that's doing this kind of work at scale is the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. They've been uh, incorporating um, <clears throat> uh, portfolio assessment into their programs for many years. And I would um, suggest if you haven't already touched base with the staff there that um, measurement folks at uh, that office would uh, have real insight into some of what the challenges are um, as well as um, strategies that uh, work. Thank you. I think um, I think that's good for then in terms of this particular framework about assessment to come back in June with um, some real experienced experts to give some ideas there would be great. Maybe what I would suggest, not to cut off any of this discussion, but um, I've heard um, definitely from Susan about the post-law school requirement supervised practice and that part of the this framework um, that we're looking at. And I'm wondering if we could get some more conversation of that part of the framework um, now about the post-law school requirement. What I put on that part of the framework was it should be, it makes it makes sense that that should be the equivalent time to licensure as an individual that takes and passes the bar exam, just in terms of the, the way that uh, would work for the applicant. Um, and then these are the areas from the framework matching, you know, in terms of administration, there's matching issues, training, the rubric or requirements, and then um, just capture this from, oops, from what Susan was saying. Um, about the equity issues being a con, of course, in this part of the framework that was given to you for today. So maybe if, if it's okay, is there are there other things to share about post-law school supervised practice on top of an experiential um, requirement in the law schools? 
How does everyone feel? <laughs> Mylan. Sorry, I'm talking way too much. Uh, but my concern about adding this on top of the experiential path, in addition to what has already been described, is that for a short period of time, just several months after graduation, it may not be worth the candle. There's a lot of administrative logistical work behind making that match. And that's what I do for my program. And there are times when placements, uh, law offices say, we it's not worth it for us to supervise someone's practice at the level that needs to be done in order for us to help the graduate build their competency. Um, we don't have the bandwidth. And so I think if it's sort of like a, not quick and dirty, but like a little add-on after the main pathway, it's just the, it, there's not going to be enough return on investment for the placement. And we're, it's going to be a lot of administrative work um, for, for not enough in return from, from both the placement and whoever's having to run it, whether it's the law school, the regulator, or, or the student even. Okay, that's helpful. Anyone else with thoughts on this supervised practice as a requirement in this framework? Alex? Hey, Audrey, am I right for Oregon, they require, or at least they proposed between 1,000 to 1,500 hours? For only those not in the Oregon experiential pathway. So they require, so uh, like a out of state uh, candidate for licensure can do supervised practice instead of the exam. And then I think what I heard Joanna say today is that people could choose to do that even in Oregon law schools, but who didn't want to go through the Oregon experiential pathway, they could choose to do supervised practice um, as well. But it's not, it's not um, the Oregon experiential pathway does not include supervised practice. Got it. That, that is one of the legs on the stool, but not part of the experiential pathway. Right. And and maybe this is the place where I, I get to chime in on behalf of the committee of our examiners. Um, at the last meeting, uh, we sort of took this issue to the to the committee, and the general consensus is that um, at least some members or a lot of members express the feeling that it is necessary, but it's too short. Um, anywhere between five to eight months is generally too short to prepare uh, applicants competently. Sorry about that. Um, but I think that's sort of the, 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 the gist of, of, of their expression. I don't want to speak um, outside of the bound, but this is the uh, impression uh, that I wanted to con con convey to the commission. Judge Reeser. So, so Alex, uh, the, the the concept in Oregon is if you want to do this law school experiential pathway, that's purely within the law schools. And uh, once you have completed that program, uh, because it's a spe special program, uh, very focused on practice, uh, th that it is the, it, it is not, diploma privilege per se, uh, because there's all kinds of classes you can take at the Oregon Law Schools. But if you take that specific program, you would be ushered in as a member of the bar. So the hour requirement, let's, let's say somebody graduates from the University of Missouri, Columbia, and they you know have difficult, even though Missouri might be the easiest bar exam in the, in the country to pass, they, they want to take advantage of that. So they, they, they find a supervisor somewhere in Oregon, let's say Multnomah County in Portland, and, and they do their 1500 hours, 1300, whatever the number is that they settle on, uh, and they submit a portfolio to the Oregon Committee of Bar Examiners. Uh, if that portfolio meets those requirements, they become an Oregon practitioner as well. So, so that's, that's how I understand the, the Oregon um, trilogy. Thank you for clarifying, that's very useful. Um, so what I'm hearing so far is, is 
the cons to supervised pra uh, practice being required in this draft version of a framework is the equity issues that the short time wouldn't be worth it for the supervisors in terms of return on investment and the short time is not worth it for the student or the law school. And that the, um, Alex brought back that the CBE was also concerned with the short time of supervised practice. Anything else about including supervised practice in this this iteration of a framework, Jackie? Just, just so I understand, is this a, a post law school add on? Because I that's right. Okay, um, I'll just add a benefit. I mean, I think what we're hoping is that the um, non exam pathway curriculum within law school is a benefit. It, it, it meets some of the concerns that we have about it, but just based on personal experience, having um, passed the bar exam and began license, I was so fortunate <laughs> to have really good supervision because I fear I would have fallen into many holes and, and harmed clients in the process. Not everybody has that benefit. And so I do think given that that people especially uh some of our students will go into solo practice or go into very small firms where they may not have the benefit of really strong mentoring and, and supervision just based on on uh, uh capacity um i see a benefit to supervised practice in terms of making sure that people get that mentoring i don't know if it's it's in lieu of or in addition to licensure but um, I just want to put a benefit out there. Thank you. Anything else on the supervised practice piece? Susan. The only thing I would add is that we might want to get some information from the Utah Bar Examiners. They had a 2020 supervised requirement option that was, I believe, 360 hours. And they have currently recommended to their Supreme Court that their supervised practice option be reduced substantially uh, to recommending only 240 hours, which is basically six weeks of full-time work. And that this would be in lieu of, of our examination. And I think it might be helpful to find out why they're doing that. Um, because they, it is quite possible that we are overestimating the benefits of supervised practice, um, especially where at least one other jurisdiction, after some thoughtful commissions and work with their Supreme Court, is going the other direction and reducing the hours. So it might be helpful to get some insight there. Thank you. Okay, anything else on supervised practice in this current iteration of this draft framework? <laughs> I think when we talk, um, if we have time at the next meeting to get to the um, out of state candidates to um, foreign educated and foreign um, barred attorneys, all, all those other categories that we have put a pin in for now, we can, this, it, this is likely to come up again, but this right now, just talking about supervised practice as part of a non-exam pathway that begins in law school. Any other comments? Okay. Um, so, okay, for, my, for the next meeting, I have that we will definitely have some experts on assessment, this type of assessment. Um, portfolio review and maybe some insight from anything um, coming in the early stages out of the NCBE, IELTS, and Oregon Partnership. And then I don't, um, and I know we're set to close pretty soon, but if there is more insight for me on other frameworks, other things you want to kind of pick apart and dissect besides what I, what was great conversation wise, but what I did hear throughout today's meeting that there is uh, uh, other thoughts that we might do that um, for other frameworks to bring back. So I just don't, I really don't wanna lose that. Um, if there are other things to bring to the table besides coming back with some tweaks on what was agendized today. Judge Reeser. Oh no, I, I just wanna be sure that we have full opportunity to address a supervised uh, license, a supervised pathway uh, for lawyers who who haven't had the opportunity to 
locate one of these uh, projected law school programs, right? Right, okay. yeah. To so talking about supervised practice as a pathway to licensure itself and for which, right. which candidates that would perhaps apply to, yes. Right. Which, which, which to some degree segues with the reciprocity discussion. Yes, absolutely. And I think that is, um, that is a, going to be a large conversation you know, that we will likely have time for in the June meeting. Um, yes, to go through all those other types, not just, yeah, not the, not California law school students, everything outside of that, that whole rest of the chart that I've been showing about who, who takes the bar exam. Exactly. Are there I guess the other piece, and I, I don't even know if this is a big deal, but I'll just raise it is, student or people coming from other law schools um will the train the portfolio um will that need to come from work done while actually in a law school in the sense in, in other words could somebody start their portfolio in law school in texas graduate from there but they haven't finished everything. And so then they wanna be in California and they do their portfolio in some other way. Are we talking about the portfolio really is law school based? I think currently in, in the draft that I put forward for today, yes. Are you thinking there's another way of looking at that in terms of um, out of state candidates who could apply for a portfolio review based on their experiential education they had? Yeah their law school. Yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, you know, could you graduate from law school and then, you know, there's a program that an enterprising California law school has for a summer where, you know, a somebody who's already graduated from a law school in another state can take some summer courses at a law school in California and finish that up and then they can finish their portfolio. And I don't know if we need to decide that now. I'm just, I'm just thinking sort of next steps. And also I can see how this might go as far as law schools trying to pay for this. No, I had a somewhat similar thought about someone who didn't choose the experiential pathway and then decided after law school, they wanted to get that experience. Or like, with, is there like an LLM, like yeah, to come out with this outcome? So I've had a similar thought, not for necessarily out of state, but certainly um, that's a thought too. Yeah, I think it's to be discussed. I don't think it's like super germane at the moment. I think we have bigger things, but just wanted to raise that. Thank you. Other thoughts, other directions to kind of um, have so I can get the right things prepared for the, our June meeting. So, so does that conclude our meeting today, Audrey? It does. I mean, I had I had a couple more slides that, about assessment, but I think that we've landed on that needing needing more um, expert um, advice on those assessment pieces than certainly what I had. Although I had I did come with a really great example of what validity means, and that's helped helped me understand <laughs> assessment. But that's not that important to share right now. So. All right, so so do we need to move to adjourn or can we just uh, you know I think that I think we can just adjourn. Yeah, yeah. you don't you don't need to move to adjourn. Well, you know. we can, this in this group we can just leave it here. And um, again, thanks for bearing with us with the unique, you know, we didn't even vote to approve the minutes, but we will come back with all the um, minutes to approve, including this one, the um, all those CAPA and uh, skills um, and legal topics related motions for next time, and then focusing on assessment and hopefully getting to all those other applicant types in our next meeting. So query, do we have dates set after June or? Yeah. 
We do. They're all, I, uh, June 9th is in my mind, but um, they're all set um, on the Blue Ribbon page when the next okay. ones are after that. Right. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. And thank you, Judge Rice, uh, Reeser, for stepping in. Right. That was being acting chair and not having acting classes is difficult. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you.